उधर का केयूर केयूर आएगा ऑनलाइन हेलो केयूर यस सर यस सर यस सर हाँ मी का जॉइंट बाय फ्रॉम टू डिवाइसेस वन इज माइन एंड वन इज माय वाइफ ओके यस सर यस सर मे बी आम तो जो दुसरा ऑनगोईंग प्रोग्राम है ना तो झाला की मी मग दोन्ही बंद करून याला जॉईन होऊन जातो शुअर सर नो प्रॉब्लेम नो प्रॉब्लेम सर काही आधी जॉईन होऊन मग पटकन बंद करतो म्हणजे जागा मिळतो नक्की नक्की सर नक्की नक्की मी आता फक्त एक तास तासभर जरा काय बोलत नाही कारण दुसरं वेगळे तर चालले सर मी आता एका वेळेला एक ठेवा की किती कमिटमेंट घेत आहे अरे तू कोण प्रमोद बोलतोय का बोलतो दार दुसरं ते अकॅडमिक्स विथ इन्स्टिट्यूट एक चाललंय ना ते संपलं की मग याला जॉईन होतोय बरं ओके त्यामुळे आता जरा थोडं हे बंद करतो ओके थँक्यू Hello everyone. In few minutes, uh, we'll start our today's session on pearls of wisdom. it's 3 uh, o'clock already and we have lot many things to cover we'll wait for next 4 minutes and at 3 o'clock uh, 35 sh uh, sharp we'll start with the session thank you
So should we start? Uh, we were just waiting till three five, and in two next two minutes we'll start. So let's start. We know the. I think Kankesh sir will give introduction till then. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So Namaskar, good afternoon, and welcome to all the uh, all faculty members, respected seniors, dear friends, and the colleagues. Uh, welcome to the second session of this unique and special webinar, Pulse of Wisdom by Pune IIP. Uh, to start with, may I request our IIP Pune president, Dr. Shirish Kankriya, to give a welcome address and also explain us the concept behind this webinar in short. Over to you, sir. Thanks. You know, um, basically, I don't want to waste any more time. Uh, the whole concept was that many of us, many of our uh, seniors and teachers go uh, to Pedicon and they deliver lectures and we who don't attend it or those who can't attend it amongst themselves as well, amongst the teachers and the faculties as well, they can't hear the other people. So the whole purpose was to have salient features of this uh, particular uh, lectures delivered, uh, not only for the faculties as well as for Pune IAP. So without uh, further wasting any time, I think uh, let's go ahead. This, uh, I'll ask uh, Vinod to welcome Vaman Khadikal sir and go ahead with the topic. Uh, thank you so much, Shirish. Uh, before we start the actual scientific session, may I request everyone to please mute themselves. If you have any question, please type them, uh, type, type them in the chat box. In between two lectures, we'll try to address maximum questions, depending on the availability of time but please do not unmute yourself to ask questions. We have so much to cover in very short time. Uh, it is also a request to uh, all the faculty uh, to uh, stick to their timelines uh, to finish off uh, everything in the uh, given time. Thank you so much. Now, without wasting much time, we'll start with our first presentation by Dr. Vaman Khadilkar, sir. Sir, as you all know, is an eminent name in the field of pediatric endocrinology and has tremendous contribution to it. With over 200 publications in reputed journals and, and authored many books and chapters with innumerable presentations, I consider all of us too lucky uh, to have Sir with us. Uh, sir, without, uh, Sir is talking on uh, childhood obesity, a serious and real, real problem that is growing up alarmingly in, the, in our day to day practice. Over to you, Sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, Sir, loud and clear. Okay. So first of all, would like to thank Pune IIP, Dr. Shirish, um, uh, Dr. Kayur, and Dr. Vinod for that introduction. Um, the topic given to me today, childhood obesity, uh, the same thing that I spoke on at Pedicon, and this has more relevance because uh, rec recently we have um, written the IIP obesity guideline update in December 2023. So most of my talk is going to be based on that. So um, let me move on. The specific learning objectives of today's talk will be understanding the basics of obesity, the new IAP BMI 2023 charts. So IAP BMI charts have now been extended. Indian waist circumference charts, understanding the metabolic syndrome, investigating the metabolic syndrome, and strategies for prevention and treatment of obesity. So I have a lot of things to cover, so I won't be going into details, but I would only be highlighting the salient points. Now, some of you might already have seen these guidelines and read it. If not, please go to the December uh, issue of Indian Pediatrics, and we have written about 25 pages of comprehensive new guideline updated. The last IIP guideline, in fact, on obesity was written in 2004, so it is almost 20 years. So like we actually ignore obesity in our own lives, personal basis, as well as in our OPD practice, we also tend to ignore even writing obesity guideline. But I'm glad that they have come in black and white now. So please have a read of those for those of you who haven't read it still. Now I'm going to start with a case. Now here is a child who's 12 year old. Both parents are diabetic. And the only reason why they came to the clinic is because of this neck pigmentation. Her height is 152, weight is 60, and BMI is 25.9. Now, please remember, very important thing, that OB children's parents will almost never come to you for obesity. They come for pigmentation like this called acanthosis, 
In boys, they will come from micropenis, primary or secondary amenorrhea, snoring, joint problems, laziness, poor academic performance, etc. You have to look at them and decide whether they are overweight and obese. But they won't come to you with the complaint of obesity or overweight. Now, this is the previous IIP growth chart application. This application has also been updated. So those of you who have not downloaded the new IIP chart application, please download because it now even calculates the Z scores for you, the standard deviation scores. So here you can see the child is significantly high in weight. The BMI is very high. It is above the IIP obesity line, but the child is also tall for MPH. So the MPH is shown here as a green dot and the child is about two percentile lines compared to MPH. So you have a kid who's tall and obese. Now the reason why I'm stressing this at this moment is because it's a very good pointer to know whether you are looking at nutritional obesity or endocrine or other syndromic obesity. And we will elucidate that further as we go along in the talk. So her blood pressure was 140-90, waist circumference was 93. Now this is a slightly new concept for pediatrician to take waist circumference in children who are overweight. I think we all must get into a habit of doing this now. Her sugar was 105, fasting and PP was 156. As you notice, both were abnormal. A1C was high, 7.8%. And she also had dyslipidemia, high cholesterol, high LDL, low HDL, and high triglycerides. Now, this child was told to change her lifestyle, have nutritional intervention, exercise, Dad. reduce screen time. And then what happened is that she comes back to you after six months. And you can appreciate here that her height is pretty much on the same percentile, but the weight has significantly dropped. And BMI now has come into the overweight range rather than obese range. So this is purely lifestyle intervention. So she was treated with lifestyle modification. At six and a half years, her height is 154, weight 52. BMI has come down. Waist has come down. And interestingly, her fasting and PP sugar is now normal. So remember, in children, if you intervene early, a whole lot of glucose as well as other metabolic abnormalities are completely reversible. That is the message here. Her lipids were all, almost normal. Improvement in anthropometric and metabolic parameters are seen. What next? Do you say bye-bye to such a child? Do you follow up? If yes, how often? Typically, the minute they hear from a doctor's mouth that, okay, things are looking better, they disappear, like she did. And then she comes back to you at 14 years of age. Now the problem, why they came back to you is once again, not for obesity, but no menarche. Secondary sexual characters are well-developed. There is significant acanthosis. Waist has increased to 100 centimeters, weight to 78, and she has gone taller. Her BMI is much higher now, 29.3. Blood pressure is high. She's hypertensive and grossly dyslipidemic now. High cholesterol, high triglyceride, high LDL. Two hours post oral glucose tolerance. Now her sugars show that she is actually diabetic with an A1C of 8.5. I want to make one point very clear here that please remember do not see as a single criteria in pediatric patient to diagnose diabetes it can be a fairly okay screening test but cannot be a diagnostic test for pediatric obesity and now her ultrasound shows bilateral polycystic ovaries as you see here you plot her again on the growth chart application and you see she remains tall weight has again gone back to obesity range and the BMI is even higher. But here you can't tell whether her obesity has worsened. All that you can tell is that she's above the IAP obesity cutoff. Now remember this because I'll be coming to grading of obesity later on. Now longitudinal charts are often very much more meaningful than a single reading. Now here you can see that the height has gone up, but the weight shows a yo-yo phenomenon. And BMI shows a much worse yo-yo phenomenon. Now, children who demonstrate yo-yo phenomena, up and down phenomena, are at a much higher risk of having worse obesity. So we should aim at a sustainable, sustained 
weight loss rather than just a short term weight loss now what again counsel nutritional advice we started on metformin because she is diabetic now she loses 5 kg starts menstruating lipids and sugar still abnormal now in a patient like this with a yo yo phenomena and this kind of dyslipidemia at such a younger age what's the likely prognosis sadly the prognosis in such patients is poor so remember obesity is a is a global problem it's a it's a pandemic it's globesity who has declared obesity as the most neglected epidemic of modern times with significant health consequences now if you look at what happened what has happened to obesity nationally in every single part of india obesity has become much worse with every passing decade obesity is excessive body fat now clinically bmi is a very useful tool but remember bmi is used in children who are older than 5 years and can be taken as a reliable indicator for obesity screening but mri dexa or underwater um, um, electric impedance are probably tools which are meant for research what about younger children in younger children you use weight for height rather than bmi so let's look at anthropometry of pediatric obesity now how do you assess obesity in children who are older it's best done by using bmi the formula is weight in kilogram upon height in meter square now these are the pediatrician friendly growth charts and here we have given a tool in the left hand corner that is called quick bmi lookup tool this is a quick bmi lookup tool so here is an example and why it's important to use bmi now see this growth chart i have put up the numbers here but you don't really need to look at the numbers here you see that the height is growing fine you understand here from the weight chart that the weight has grown much more than what is ideal because two percentiles have been crossed but when you actually plot the bmi you realize that it's way too high so what cannot be really appreciated just based on height and weight charts can be immediately appreciated on a bmi chart so this looks fine this may be a bit too much but bmi shows it's way too high this is unacceptable this is a very rapid weight gain and requires immediate intervention for younger children use weight for length chart and not bmi charts now the bmi cut offs for children who are older iip has defined 23 adult equivalent for overweight and 27 adult equivalent for obesity for younger children who has defined weight for height greater than 1 sds is at risk greater than 2 sds is overweight and greater than 3 sds is obesity so remember who has given some allowance for younger children to be chubby but it changes beyond 5 years this is a reminder to tell you that obesity is a lifestyle disorder <coughs> and here as you can see the gentleman is saying pizzas colas burgers candy and the the man says yes they certainly look malnourished to me so it's lifestyle malnutrition in india is at both ends under nutrition and obesity so it's a lifestyle disease now there are some key pointers in anthropometry that helps you as a pediatrician to know whether am i looking at primary or exogenous nutritional obesity or am i looking at endogenous or secondary obesity and it's pretty easy here is an example this boy is tall and overweight as seen here on the growth tall as well as he's overweight tall and obese is exogenous obesity primary obesity nutritional obesity lifestyle obesity whereas exactly opposite here is a little boy who is short and obese so short and obese is endogenous so this is secondary so it could be hormonal it could be syndromic or it could be bone disorders so remember endogenous or secondary obesity patient is short and obese nutritional tall and obese now on the new iip the pediatrician friendly iip charts you have got the bmi lookup tool and i'll show you how to use it 
So this is the BMI lookup tool. Just like you use weight for height charts in younger children, you use weight for length charts here. And here is an example. If the if a child is one thirty five centimeter tall with a weight of thirty, she is normal. If she is thirty five kilo, same height, she is overweight. If she is forty five kilo, same height, she is obese. And if she is twenty kilo, same height, she is underweight. So this single simple tool removes the need for calculation. And in a busy pediatric OPD, this can be very useful. Now let us look at why do we need newer bmi charts now here is a bad situation all over the world where we have broken records and scales so we now need to grade obesity not only define obesity grade it so iap define extended charts so class 2 obesity is greater than 120% of 27 cut off but less than 140% and class 3 is greater than 140% of the iap obesity cutoff so these charts are shown here class 3 is the purple line class 2 is the brown line and the standard iap previously defined obesity and overweight line 23 and 27 adult equivalent these charts have been uploaded to iap website and you can download them same for boys now metabolic syndrome now the importance of waist circumference see for all risk factors associated with obesity waist circumference as a stand alone parameter is more sensitive and specific to define metabolic syndrome and to suspect an abnormality so what is metabolic syndrome abdominal waist circumference more than 97th 90th centile for the age for gender and ethnicity plus two or more of the following and what are the criteria dyslipidemia hypertriglyceridemia low hdl high blood pressure or high fasting glucose or a known type 2 diabetes this constitute metabolic syndrome now iap 2023 guidelines uh-huh. recommend use of indian waist circumference charts which are again uploaded onto the iap website and a cut off of 70th percentile is suggested rather than 90th percentile because at 70th percentile itself we are able to see some metabolic abnormalities so remember that waist circumference is an independent predictor of insulin resistance dyslipidemia and hypertension <clears throat> where do you check waist you palpate the iliac crest ask the patient to stand straight and measure it in expiration that should be then plotted on the indian waist circumference charts these are the indian waist circumference chart 70th percentile is highlighted and they are uploaded on iap website for you to download and use now if you look at the mechanism of metabolic syndrome what happens is a child becomes obese the leptin goes up there is insulin resistance and also there are deleterious effect on the vasculature that activates renin angiotensin system leads to hypertension insulin resistance leads to beta cell exhaustion hyperglycemia and diabetes and similarly it leads to lipolysis it increases triglycerides and leads to dyslipidemia so what is actually an adaptation becomes disadaptation when you clinically examine a child you look at the weight height bmi waist circumference blood pressure acanthosis acne hirsutism fundoscopy for pseudotumor cerebri then joints look at peripheral edema goiter neurodevelopmental assessment and genitalia now remember non alcoholic fatty liver disease can be silent and unless you examine the liver by measuring sgot and sgpt in every obese child you will not be able to pick up metabolic uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease at a year, at an earlier stage so always ask for Uh, sgot and sgpt in fasting state in a child who is obese there are certain cutoffs which have been written in the guideline now these are the cutoffs for lipids in children and whatever your laboratory actually gives are cutoffs for adults so please don't follow them follow these lipid cutoffs in children you can probably just print this and put it up in your opd they are much lower in children 
Now, 2023 guidelines give a stepwise approach. I don't have time to discuss that. But this algorithm tells you that you have a staged approach for pediatric obesity. And that goes from primary prevention to structured weight management to comprehensive multidisciplinary intervention to tertiary care intervention. And this is a very useful algorithm. Again, can be printed and used in clinical practice. Now, last couple of slides, one on pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery, adjunct use of pharmacotherapy to a comprehensive lifestyle modification program is recommended in adolescent greater than 12 years of age, having class two obesity with immediate life-threatening comorbidities, such as severe obstructive apnea or class three obesity with or without comorbidities. And same is true for bariatric surgery. See the days when we recommended for children greater than 18 are only recent, but the new guidelines have said that if children are greater than 12 years and have class 3 obesity or class 2 obesity with comorbidities, they may be considered for bariatric surgery provided that there is failure of lifestyle modification and medical and medications. So my take home message is primary obesity is the commonest entity prevalent amongst overweight and obese children. That is nutritional. Think of endocrine obesity in a child who is short and obese. Metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes is becoming commoner and occurring at a younger and younger age. Think of syndromic obesity in a child with other features, developmental delay, hypogonadism, visual and hearing problems. Prevention is better than treatment. So please use BMI tool and pick up obesity and overweight early before it is too late. Staged approach to obesity management is recommended and is written in the guidelines. Pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery can be considered in children older than 12 years with stage 3 obesity or stage 2 with complications. And please, for God's sake, once again, my urge to you is start plotting weight and height on a chart and calculate BMI and use IIP growth charts. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for this very script and beautiful talk on the obesity. Uh, may I now please request you to stop your screen share. And also I'll request our next speaker, Dr. Anand Deshpande sir, to please share his screen. Uh, again, I request all members to keep their microphone on the mute mode. And if anyone have uh, any question regarding the lecture, they can put their uh, question in the chat box. May I request Dr. Anand Deshpande sir, to please uh, start their screen, screen share. Is it seen? Uh, it's coming probably, sir. But seen or not seen? No, sir. Is it seen? Yes, no? sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. it has started now. As you all know, uh, Dr. Deshpande sir is a very bold, very, uh, very, very, uh, very known name in Pune IAP for his immense contribution to the development of uh, development of association. As sir is also past president of Pune IAP and an EB member of Central IAP in 2019. Sir is a senior practitioner and a PG teacher and examiner for over 25 years. Over to you, sir. Yeah, what point is seen? Yes, sir, it is seen, sir. Thank you, Sirish. Thank you, Pune IP, for allowing this or uh, keeping this program of uh, I, uh, Pedicon presentation. So that everybody knows what went in the pedi pedicon. So I was given the topic of superficial skin infection childhood recognition and management. It was a panel discussion, and in all four panelists, I have tried to convert it in the lecture form and try to re reduce it uh, to twenty minutes. So it's my effort uh, to do that. I uh, we have deleted some slides. 
let's see how much we can complete uh, i will start now uh, i would like to mention the courtesy dr sanjay mankar who uh, provided me the ball started ball rolling with him and we had some few slides from him then later on i uh, gathered few from my own patients and special thanks to the children and their parents for their uh, cooperation and permission to share the uh, images Skin is the largest organ of the body, accounting for over 15% of the total body weight, with underlying soft tissues, which includes fat, layers, fascia, muscles, represents majority of the tissues in the body. Skin and soft tissue infection reflect inflammatory microbial invasion of the epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissues. Microbial disease of the skin may take place by one of the following routes, direct invasion of epidermis, hematogenous spread of the organism, such as meningococcal rash or viruses like measles, or um, chicken pox, toxin mediated damage from the infection elsewhere from the body, for example, SSSS. These are the ways or these are the parts of the skin which get infected in different infections. Epidermis is involved in varicella and measles, uh, microbial causes zoster, varicella zoster or measles virus, keratin is involved in the ringworms, epidermis is involved in the impetigo. Aspirogens and aureus are the organisms. Dermis is involved in erysipelas. Aspirogens is organism. Hair follicles are involved in folliculitis, boils, carbuncles. Aureus is organism. Sebum glands are involved in acne. Propinobacterium acne was, is the organism. In cellulitis, subcutaneous fat is involved. Beta hemolytic septococci are uh, responsible in fascia, necrotizing fasciitis. Aspirogens are mixed anaerobic infection. In myositis, toxicity extends of S aureus and in gangrene, C perfringens. Now let's start with the cases. These are the few cases I'll put a few, few photographs. Uh, this is the second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, sixth one. So Apparently, one may feel that these are the different condition, skin condition, but this is one skin condition manifesting in different forms. And that condition is very common to us. We always see in the OPD. So what is the differential diagnosis? The differential diagnosis depends on the type of the lesion present. The burrows are virtually pathognomic of the human scabies. This is scabies. All the eight uh, slides were of the scabies. Uh, having a different manifestation. In the scabies patient, actually, there are more, not more than five to seven uh, females uh, in the body or the organisms in the body, subcoptus cabi. It is the body reaction that gives the appearance. So more the body reaction, more the severe, uh, the pattern will be different. The papular vascular regions can be there, which can be mixed with the papular articaria, canine scabies, chicken pox, viral exanthems, drug eruption, etc. Eczematous regions may mimic like an atopic dermatitis. Scabies can mimic like an atopic dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis. Nodular scabies is frequently misdiagnosed as urticaria pigmentosa and Langan cell histiocytosis. See, this is a nodular scabies. There is nothing different. It is a body reaction to the scabies. Only scabies where there are n number of organisms uh, sarcoptus scabies in the body is a Norwegian scabies, which is quite rare and it is in the institutions. Scabies is the diagnosis. Topical application of 5% parametrin lotion for 8 to 14 hours is highly effective. Reapplication after one week, itching may persist for a long time. Oral ivermectin, two doses of 200 microgram per kg, one week apart in scabies. It can be given anybody about six months of age with HIV or immunocompromised, it is, but it can be given to the normal child also. Treat all close contacts and wash clothing, needles, towels, wash in hot water and treat all the family members at one time. Otherwise, you'll keep on treating for a lifetime. All the family members, all contacts will be treated at one time. Now, this is something interesting. Very few people must have seen it. This looks like some nail condition. Initially, when such the, this type of patient came to me, I felt that I'm dealing with some either uh, fungal infection of the nail or a nail dystrophy. But it was 
recently appearing so uh, there was on inquiring there was a history of there was a history of hfmd so onico medias is following had foot mouth disease not every patient will get it few of them will get it and if the disease original disease is milder one the patient may have forgotten it be you lines and onico medias is right index and finger nail followed by the hfmd see the bayu line this is a bayu line here bayu line on the right great toenail following hfmd so uh, there is you have to give just assurance the assurance as the new nail will come the original nail uh, will uh, get uh, they will become brittle they will fall off and the new nail will be normal this i don't require any introduction when i prepared this uh, presentation that, that time this was not prevalent but thereafter you know, everybody knows everybody has seen these patients this this is just and anybody can recognize now because last two months we have seen lot of cases of this what is the differential diagnosis recognition blanching papillary rash that is classically described as a sandpaper rash the rash develops within 2 to 3 days after infection but can be delayed up to 7 days trunk and underarms are growing are affected first and then it spreads to the extremities usually palms and soles the circumoral area are so spread making it pallor like the strawberry tongue becomes a with white coating of the tongue with hyperplastic papilla as the white coating resolves the papules remain giving the appearance of a strawberry dd is impetigo measles chicken pox and hfmd so diagnosis is a scarlet fever antibiotics penicillin like amoxicillin if allergic then linazolid or clindamycin supportive care including hydration and sid avoid complications also with the scarlet fever they will can have all the complication of the streptococcal infection now this is something very uncommon this is case from my own practice came some 2 3 years back uh, the uh, patient this or 3 4 months maybe with a rash of the palms here mother gave the history that i had the similar rash during pregnancy that that clinched the diagnosis the vdrl of mother was already done but nobody has reacted to that because nowadays we feel that the syphilis has gone so if it was done it was positive but it was not treated so this is a case of a congenital syphilis it is quite rare but it is reappearing syphilis is reappearing as the hiv is going down the diseases which were decreased because of the uh, efforts done to prevent hiv are coming back so this should be kept in the mind the syphilis is not that frequent but it should be at the back of mind in any case of what are the differential diagnoses rash usually is oval and maculopapular but becomes copper colored with discomation mostly in the palms and soles shown in the slide the characteristic vesicular bullous eruption may develop with erythema blisters and eventually crusting and skin wrinkling mucocutaneous junctions may also be involved the lips becoming weepy thickened and rough differential diagnosis congenital syphilis evaluate risk as per the maternal situation problem is the benzazin benzin benzazin penicillin available but benzyl penicillin which is recommended is g is not available so you can use in some cases ceftriaxone it it covers many of the cases so this is quite common this is we uh, see as a pediatrician this is a widespread infection i'll few, present few more slides it will be evident for you this is another way it presents this is another way this is another way all are the same this is most converse we are most conversant with this so what is this this there are two varieties bullous variety non bullous variety neonates it is impetigo it either it is bullous variety or non bullous variety neonates epidermolysis bullous what are differential diagnosis in neonates epidermolysis bullous are bullous mastocytosis herpetic infections early scarlet skin syndrome 
older children allergic contacted dermatitis erythema multiforme linear iga dermatosis pen fingers and bullous pen fingers non bullous variety virus is herpes simplex varicella zoster fungi tinea corporis carrion arthropod bites parasitic infections kbs pediculosis capitis so diagnosis of 1 and 3 impetigo contagiosa and 2 was a bullous impetigo management topical mupirocin oxenoxacin ratapamulin systemic cephalexin 25 to 50 mg per kg per day for 7 days cloxacillin clindamycin tmp smx this is also a brother elder brother of the impetigo it's what is the differential diagnosis same as impetigo differentiating features versus impetigo deeper infection with a formation of thick crust following small pustules on the erythematous base which may lead to ulceration the crust is difficult to detach from the underlying skin multiple lesions developing due to auto inoculation healing with scarring takes place takes several weeks so what is this called as this is called as ecthyma dry tightly adherent crust in ecthyma diagnosis ecthyma management is same as uh, uh, hey, uh, impetigo but antimicrobial oral are required in ecthyma systemic oral antibiotic are required antihistaminic severe puritis personal hygiene and good nutrition is advised this is uh, a, this is a variety of a, a common condition uh, earlier presenting earlier presenting con, uh, uh, presentation of a very common condition which we know we discuss this is stage 1 of the sssss this is called as a sunray appearance the radial cracks fissures crust around the mouth sss will have this so differential diagnosis onset of rash may be preceded by fever malaise irritability and skin tenderness scarlatiform rash more in the flexural and perio or orofacial areas conjunctiva inflamed and also purulent sometimes later erythematous skin rapidly acquires a wrinkled appearance and severe cases sterile flaccid blisters and erosions develop diffusely skin is extremely tender that is that is important thing circumoral erythema with radial crusting and fissuring around the eyes and mouth and nose nicolas kiskain is positive differential diagnosis bullous impetigo epidermolysis bullosa pen fingers drug eruption and ten this is a second it will progress to further with proper sss with multiple bullae sss retus disease systemic antibiotics oral or iv as per the involvement apply emoluments emollients for lubrication in severe infection hospitalized with fluids and electrolyte management pain infection control and wound care with isolation practices this is another picture of the staphylococcal scar disease syndrome this is important you can photograph this this is from icpp in the general practical pediatrics cloxacillin 5200 cephalexin 25 to 50 mg cephalozolin 50 mg per kg clindamycin 10 to 20 mg per kg amoxicillin clavulanate 40 mg per kg and for mrsa vancomycin 40 to 60 linozolate 30 mg per kg clindamycin 10 to 20 mg per kg doxycycline 100 mg bid tmp smx 8 to 12 mg per kg daptomycin 4 mg per kg We have no pediatric data about daptomycin. This is a devastating condition, very rare. One may see once in a lifetime. In the case of a chicken pox, it can occur in other cases also. But in the case of a chicken pox, is uh, one particular vesicle or becomes suddenly uh, it inflames. It there is a changes. and there is extreme tenderness of the skin around and this appearance appears within hours 
within few hours the patient who was already very stable becomes extremely toxic and if not acted upon then where one may lose the patient or at least one may lose the limb if so one has to know this condition to act fast later on after treatment will look like this differential diagnosis pain out of proportion to the clinical findings failure to respond to the initial antibiotic therapy the hard wooden feel of the subcutaneous tissue extending beyond the area of apparent skin involvement systemic toxicity often with altered mental status edema or tenderness extending beyond the cutaneous erythema crepitus indicating gas in the tissue bullous lesions and skin necrosis or ecchymosis so diagnosis is necrotizing fasciitis management is identify the disease and immediate institution of definitive treatment without any delay for the investigations surgical debridement is mainstay treatment and might require repeated debridement iv antibiotic effective against both aerobes and anaerobes you can start with broad spectrum and if you find in culture they, they can be micro, polymicrobial they can be monomicrobial you find the later on that they are monomicrobial you can switch down to the narrow down to the na the therapy initially you cannot contemplate support your management fluids oxygen support you glycemic control from a very rare uh, devastating condition to a very common condition this is a this is a, as you know this is a folliculitis superficial pustular infection involving the hair follicles very follicular structures pustules rupture followed by crusting common sites are head back buttocks and extremities differential diagnosis furuncle carbuncle abscesses diagnosis folliculitis management warm compresses topical antibiotics like meporosin systemic antibiotic systemic antibiotic therapy only if signs of systemic involvement or if cellulitis this is another variety of a streptococcal infection this is called as a blast this is called as a blistering distal dactylitis blistering distal dactylitis i can show you you can see once again recognition a superficial blistering infection of the volar pad of the fat pad on the distal portion of the finger or thumb proximal phalanges palms and toes blisters are filled with watery purulent fluid containing pmnl gpcs diagnosis blistering distal dactylitis management incision and drainage systemic cephalosporin therapy for 10 days now come to the current what epidemic of a fungal infection is going on especially in adults so these are all fungal infections see the, you can see the that say typically fungal infection clear, starts from center and clears from the center and spreads so there are circles different circles and of spread so that indicates use of steroid if there are if there are no use of steroid you don't have the different circles you have a single circle that is proceeding but the multiple circle circle inside the circle indicates the common common routine combination of a antifungal and steroid has been used and i appreciate that there are satellite lesions this is very peculiar of the fungal uh, dermatophytosis recognition the most typical clinical sign begins as a dry mild erythematous elevated scaly papule or plaque that spreads centrifugally and clears centrally to form a characteristic annular lesion at times plaques with the advancing borders may spread over a large area group pustules are another variant dds are granuloma annulare pneumonia eczema pityriasis rosea psoriasis seborrheic dermatitis erythema chronicum marginatum tinea versicolor so tinea corporis management is topical antifungals imidazolin terbinafine or naphtylene twice a daily for 2 to 4 weeks severe cases oral glucosamine for 4 weeks alternately itraconazole orally for with a 1 to 2 weeks of oral therapy combination of topical corticosteroid antifungal should not be used 
as it may result in a persistent or worsening infection. This is most important message. Never use the combination. Even you have a doubt, don't use steroid. Use only antifungal. And uh, basically, any antifungal, topical or oral, if started, should be given for one skin cycle. One skin cycle is about three to four weeks. So the uh, that much uh, coverage should be given. Otherwise, the things will recur again. What is the difference? These are the two varieties of the. At some places, the inguinal uh, ties are involved, but the so difference between the last two slides, the confluent uh, in irritant contact dermatitis and candida dermatitis. In irritant contact dermatitis, the confluent areas of shiny erythema are there. Genotocrural creases are not typically involved. You can see here they are involved. This is candidial. This is diaper. Another one. Negative KOH then skin care. Frequent diaper changes, barrier preparations, emollients, and topical steroids usually resolves under a week with appropriate treatment. Candida dermatitis, bright red, scaly rash with satellite lesions, inguinal force are usually involved, positive KOH 10, similar to irritant contact dermatitis plus topical antifungal treatment, usually resolves within two weeks with appropriate treatment. So diaper dermatitis. Management barrier creams, zinc oxide, more frequent diaper changes, disposable diapers of superabsorbent variety associated with less dermatitis than cloth diapers. Treat cause of the diarrhea if present. Candidal dermatitis management apply imidazole in cream twice a daily. Zinc oxide paste to production uh, to, for protection along with the anti candidal cream is beneficial. Corticosteroid use only if severe along with. Oral antifungals, if colonizers. This is something different, uncommon. Is a typical manifestation is a bright red and sharply demarcated rash around the anus with the centrifugal spread. Symptoms include anal pruritus 78 to 100 percent, rectal pain 50 percent, painful defecation 50 percent, and blood streaked stools 25 20 percent to 35 percent. Differential diagnosis, diaper dermatitis, candidiasis, seboric dermatitis, trauma, and pin one, pin worm infest, infestation. Treatment, antibiotics like amoxicillin, two weeks, less symptomatic. Diagnosis, perianal streptococcal dermatitis. Perianal streptococcal dermatitis. This is impetigo, so not impetigo, intertrigo because of the candida occurs most commonly in the axilla and groin and the neck areas and the breast under the pendulous abdominal folds in the umbilicus and in the gluteal cleps. Typical lesions are large confluent areas of a moist denuded erythematous skin with an irregular macerated scaly border. Satellite lesions are characteristic. Diagnosis candidial intertrigo same as candidal infection. This is very common. The characteristic macules are covered with the scale, which often begin as a perifollicular location, enlarge and merge to form confluent patches, most commonly on the neck, upper chest, back, and upper arms. Facial lesions are common in adolescents. Lesions occasionally appear on the forearms, dorsum, and hands and pubis. Generally, it is more common in adolescent or older children and less common in the younger child. Differential diagnosis is dermatophytosis, seboric dermatitis, pityriasis alba, secondary syphilis. Diagnosis is a tinea versicola. Will occur in older child more commonly. So appropriate topical therapy may include either selenium 2% shampoo applied for 10 minutes before rinsing for two weeks Ketoconazole 2% shampoo three times a week for a month or a single application daily for three days. Terbinafin spray once or twice a week for one to two weeks. 
oral therapy with ketoconazole or fluconazole 400 mg repeated in one week or itraconazole 200 mg for 24 hours so 5 to 7 days maintenance therapy with selenium sulfide shampoo and ketoconazole 2% shampoo once a week may be used this is fungal infection of the nail irregular single numerous white patches on the surface of the nail unassociated with the peronychal inflammation and deep infection middle and ventral layers of the nail plate and perhaps the nail bed are the sites of infection the nail initially develops a yellowish discoloration slowly becomes thickened brittle loosened from the nail bed differential diagnosis is dystrophic nail psoriasis lichen planus eczema and tracheodite The diagnosis is tinea unguium. Management is a itraconazole therapy. Double the normal donors dose for one week of each month for three to four months. The nail cycle is of three to six months in hand nails and in two nails is about six to twelve months. So the duration of therapy varies from the whether it is a toe nail infection or a hand nail infection. Oral grisophilia in, in cases of onychomycosis. Mm. So this is a, a fungal infection of the scalp, hairy areas, recognition. Endothrix infection create a pattern like a black dot ringworm. That is because this the hair become brittle and they fall. So hair uh, roots will be seen as the black dots. And there will be alopecia. So it looks like a black dot ringworm, characterized by the initially by many small circular patches of alopecia in which hair are broken off close to the hair follicle. A severe inflammatory response produces elevated boggy granulomatous mass, which are often studied with pustules, fever, pain, and regional adenopathy are common, and permanent scarring and alopecia may present. This is carry on. The differential diagnosis is same as tinea as discussed earlier. So here, carry-on, I can show you. This is a carry-on, where the pustules are there on the... Black dot ringworm, tinea capitis, second is a carry-on. Oral grisophilin with fatty meals for 8 to 12 weeks till the culture turns negative. Other antifungals, terbinafine, itraconazole, preferred topical antifungals with oral therapy is recommended treat patient and potential carriers in the family with sporicidal shampoos vigorous application needed this is very well known to us molluscum contagium i will not go into the details we can diagnose molluscum contagium hello huh? hello Diagnosis, molluscum contagion, management. Most important thing, molluscum contagion is a self-limiting disease. So if the patient is ready to wait, the many a times it will disappear by six to nine months by on, an, on its own. The average attack lasts for six to nine months. Pati patients to avoid shared baths and towels until the infection is clear. Immunotherapy in cases of severe forms with intradermal uh, uh, with a candida or trichophoton and antigen repeated every four weeks until resolution. Young children can thread in applied with adhesive bandage, which is not available in India. I inquired with the uh, uh, skin specialist. In India, they use TCA uh, application, local TCA application. They do mechanical curettage also. By mechanically, they remove or they can use the liquid nitrogen also. If um, important message, if there is a grouped molluscum, if the mollusca is starting grouping, then you should look for the immunodeficiency and the immunodeficiency workup should be done. These are uh, again, another viral infection, viral warts, not that common as the molluscum. This is also again viral warts. This is also viral ward over the sole 
on the soul, the viral warts appear differently because they bear the weight of the body. So viral wart again, they are they are have their own cycle. So you can wait. You can wait. More than sixty-five percent warts disappear spontaneously within two years. Hyperkeratotic warts to be treated regularly and frequently. Common warts can be destroyed by application of liquid nitrogen or pulse dilator. But you can wait. Most of sixty-five percent warts can spontaneously disappear. This is you must have uh, had diagnosis in your mind. What is the differential diagnosis? Hallmark of the skin vesicle and shallow painful ulcers with acute onset with a small two to four millimeter size vesicles around. Surrounded by erythematous base, which evolve into shallow, minimally erythematous ulcers after few days. Differential diagnosis in petigo, SJS, herpesgina, erythema multiforme, after stomatitis. Diagnosis is herpes simplex and herpes labialis. Herpes simplex are known to group together. They don't have a dermatomal presentation, but they uh, two three herpes simplex they group together. Management: Oral antiviral, acyclovir, valacyclovir, or famicyclovir. Dose to be increased in immunocompromised patients. No role of topical antivirals in herpes, either zoster or simplex. So, in either in zoster or in simplex, there is no role of a topical antiviral. Supportive therapy: NSAID and fluid management, etc. This is. Blistering, like it was, we have seen blistering, distal dactylitis streptococcal. This is again looks like the same, but it is due to the herpes. So it is called as herpetic vitlo. Recognition: deeply painful blisters on the digits, which may erode secondarily. Differential diagnosis: pyronychia, blistering dactylitis, felon finger. Diagnosis is a herpetic vitlo. Management same as HSV, oral antivirals and supportive care. Incision and drainage in selective cases. This is zoster, very easy to diagnose. I mean, everybody of us seen. The metamol distribution is a characteristic. It is very difficult to diagnose before the lesions appear. It will present as a pain only. Differential in cellulitis, folliculitis, chicken pox, lichen, lichen striatus, erysipelas, herpes zoster management, oral or IV antivirals, depending on the presentation. Valsaclovir preferred orally nowadays. All cases of herpes to undergo testing for HIV. All cases of herpes to undergo testing for HIV. Other supportive care: NSAID, topical antiseptics, etc. Take-home message: Skin and soft tissue infection in children are common cause of hospital visits. Thorough history and physical examination can provide clues to the pathogens involved. Systemic manifestations like septic shock, invasive disease, and toxic shock syndrome are potentially dreadful conditions associated with SSTI. Chronic and recurrent pyoderma are often associated with underlying chronic diseases like eczema, and may be the first markers of underlying immunodeficiency states. Scabies, tinea, and pediculosis are common non-bacterial SSTI. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for this very informative uh, lecture uh, on the issues very commonly faced by the practicing pediatricians. Uh, now, may I please request you to stop your screen share, and as I also request our next speaker, Dr. Pramod Kulkarni, sir, to please share his screen with the presentation. A gentle reminder to everyone to keep their uh, microphones on the muted state. If anyone has any questions, they can just put their question in the chat box, and I request all the speakers uh, to answer those questions in the chat uh, chat box itself. Thank you so much. I request Dr. Kulkarni sir to please start his screen mm -hmm. share.
डॉक्टर कुलकर्णी सर आर यू देयर गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबडी आर माय स्लाइड्स यस विजिबल नाउ यस सर परफेक्टली विजिबल थैंक यू वेरी मच शनी शन पुणे आई एम पी फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच के यूर एंड विनोद फॉर कैरिंग इट आउट सो नाइसली एंड रीएडजस्टिंग माय स्लॉट एट द मिडल विथ टू स्टालवर्ड्स अहेड एंड टू स्टालवर्ड्स बिहाइंड so this was a panel discussion i participated in kochi pedicon as the title says it was infection mimics and dr bakul parekh moderated it with a very nice collection of cases which we will run through and have some learning points out of these cases discussed so the usual stories fever is equal to infection viral parasitic bacterial tuberculosis or many other types are diagnosed so let us start with the first case this is a 3 year male child 15 days of fever received first line antibiotics counts are little higher uh, polymer predominant platelets are normal and again change with second antibiotic the fever persists visited one more pediatrician fever persists counts repeated on higher side again neutrophil predominant platelet on higher side vidal coming positive as usual one in 160 one in 160 antibiotic change to cefixide excuse me sir excuse me sir sir your screen is not moving slides are not moving dr pramod kulkarni sir your slides uh, are not moving uh, it's a pdf presentation uh, can you see my slide right now only one one uh, picture is seen no not not seen your screen not seen no sir probably it's uh, your screen saver is there the rest of the things are not visible uh, uh, reshare reshare sir uh, no not the uh, cases are visible no slides are not visible only no sir slides are not visible only your screen pa saver pa is pa visible pana pana this sir kedri hmm is it visible now uh, no sir it's still uh, it's not there uh, sir have you mailed your presentation to shishal on the pune iit email anyway i'll just uh, run through these slides i'll talk about it uh, you will have to listen to it little with little attention so the first case yes. was a 3 year male child uh, who had fever for 2 weeks with raised counts uh, with three antibiotics taken and again the second repeat count telling us a rising wbc counts as well as platelet counts the vidal turned out to be positive one in 160 and the line of treatment was changed to cefixime and azithromycin with enteric fever in mind so what are the things so looking at the uh, details of the clinical picture the child had daily high spikes the interfebrile period was normal there was no travel history no significant cox contact there was macular rash without itching all over body since last one day the child was irritable during fever the child had anorexia cervical lymph nodes bilateral multiple largest being 2 cm liver spleen were just palpable and what were the trends now the count repeated third times were 35000 total with predominant polymorphs 90% ESR being 130 and CRP being now more than 100. We have a picture with this classic story. What do we have? We have infection mimic with us and uh, not typhoid. So rising WBC counts, persistent fever with a pattern, and rising inflammatory markers in form of raised ESR and CRP, and absence of any other clinical clue. Some lymph nodes just palpable spleen. and the diagnosis as usual as we think in case of any fever especially infection mimic the first possibility is rheumatological disorder and in this case with the evanescent rash esogi was thought of and it turned out to be esogi 
of course it's an exclusion diagnosis all the other infections were ruled out by the gold standards that is blood culture and specific work up for the subacute or chronic infection so a fever persistent with rash and a rising trend of inflammatory markers in form of neutrophil predominant wbc counts rising esr crp or ferritin and serocytis mucositis even in the absence of arthritis we must think of sogia because the criteria for sogia is fever more than 2 weeks even in the absence of arthritis which may develop during the evolution so the pattern becomes very important and the associated symptoms in form of rash and exclusion of the infection becomes very important then when will you think of non infectious conditions uh, conditions in a fever so it is dependent on the duration of fever you have your dds of course infection uh, will usually common infection will last for 8 to 10 days anything beyond that we must think of subacute or chronic infections as well as the second coming in rheumatological disorder that is immune dysregulation problems either autoimmune in form of rheumatological disorder or immunodeficiency or more likely to be in third in line will be malignancy to be thought of there are few other uncommon uh, causes of such a fever which are not fever but fever mimics like drug hypersensitivity as well as malignancy as well as some of the lymphoproliferative disorders in some cases the second case was 3 years male child who had had a fever cold cough for 15 days had ear discharge from left side and no other complaints counts were little high platelets were normal esr was 32 urine x ray were normal ear swab uh, culture grew nothing blood culture urine culture were normal the child kept on running fever 101 to 103 was treated with 70 mg of uh, ceftriaxone per kg for 5 days as per csom uh, protocol there was no improvement on day 6 of hospitalization the child developed uh, tachypnea hepatospinomegaly and abdominal distension had some rash as well and the possibilities the repeat counts were showing neutrophilic leukocytosis with little neutrophils counts higher esr 48 well felix coming positive again the child was treated in view of rickettsia with doxycycline as well as chloramphenicol the symptoms persisted and now the repeat count showed progressive drop in hemoglobin progressive drop in wbc counts total as well as progressive drop in platelets so a progressive cytopenia not only by cytopenia here it is pan cytopenia and the esr was also falling down and what becomes the possibility obviously some immunological complication of a common infection and the repeat investigation showed bilirubin of 4 mg hgpt was 450 prothrombin time was abnormal above 1 minute leptospira negative ps4 mp negative and urea was normal and the ferritin was in 15600 values triglycerides were raised and as we all we can make it it was hlh confirmed the child had hepatosplenomegaly as well as ascites bone marrow so not essential for a diagnosis in this case confirmed hemophagocytosis and all the criteria fulfilled this was a confirmed case of post infective or secondary hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis so hlh nowadays a second common immunological complication which is non infectious but post or peri infectious we must keep in mind primary hlh is rare usually presents in infancy and is difficult to deal with then we had the third case fever 12 year girl fever 5 to 6 days no other symptoms count showing uh, leukopenia a uh, little thrombocytopenia dengue serology negative started on antibiotic persistent fever had erythematous rash and referred for opinion she was toxic febrile there was generalized erythematous rash most prominent on face hands and feet a uh, one tender cervical lymph node tender hepatomegaly and mild splenomegaly and the differential diagnosis all the common dengue infectious mononucleosis scarlet sle and others were ruled out there was significant history when dicked out with the detail detailed history taking there was history of patient being initiated on carbamazepine a month ago for stammering and jittery movements and what's the differential diagnosis 
definitely carbamazepine induce drug hypersensitivity reaction so though rare that's one of the uh, possibility in case of fever which is not fitting into routine infection then you have we had the fourth case which was a 19 month old girl had four days fever swelling behind right ear for four days poor intake oral toxic febrile child right posterior infraauricular swelling a lymph node without irritable tenderness who had received coamoxiclav cefadroxil and ibuprofen without any relief the counts were high poly at platelets were 5 lakh 40 thousand crp was 400 blood culture was sterile and the possibility with this age with these manifestation the child was thought of initially as pyogenic infection and put on parenteral antibiotics the case progress uh, the cultures became negative, the child uh, turned out to be negative, child didn't respond to next line, antibiotics, parental as well, and after four days, the child had persistent irritability and lips started appearing cracked. The tongue turned out to be a little red. There was palmar erythma and the cervical node was a little decreasing but not resolved. Obviously, with this age, with this manifestation, different point time we have got different symptoms and signs this was proven kawasaki disease though the echo was normal this child was diagnosed on day nine the child was treated with fulfillment of the clinical criteria of kawasaki as and treated with IV IG, uh, ig as well as aspirin and the child responded well here the point of discussion was how do you exclude kawasaki disease and the take home message was the rash being non vesiculobulous non vesiculobulous rash and the second inflammatory markers raised so the inflammatory markers are almost always raised in form of esr and crp above the normal high platelet counts typically occur at the end of first week but you can get those normal in the early week as well so different diagnostic point positive at different point time of evolution of any febrile illness are very important to be taken in together in consideration in together and a diagnosis being reached there were few other cases uh, uh, presented by dr uh, bakul those were good cases of uh, uh, one of the uh, possible uh, case of uh, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma with uh, in the older child without any focus, but uh, uh, chest uh, X-ray showing some lymph nodes and without anything turned out to be Hodgkin's lymphoma. There was one case of P. Papa as well as a case of periodic fever syndrome, which is again an infection mimic. So the, after these all cases, the take home message, just let us learn few of the things. Though infections are the first possibility in case of febrile illness, just wait, wait for the pattern to develop, the symptoms and signs to evolve. By that time, exclude the common infection. And here I will advise to go for the gold standard of inclusion or exclusion, not the surrogate markers, inflammatory marker counts and routine imaging. We have to have preferably microbiological diagnosis or at least the serological diagnosis. So unless the gold standards are met with for particular infection, one should not entertain ongoing fever in a possible infection case as infection and escalate in the antibiotic. You must always think of in such cases the fever mimics. Again, all the rheumatological conditions are diagnosed by clinical scores as well as the clinical criteria, immunological criteria, as well as laboratory criteria. And these are all well defined. So there is no, nothing uh, else just to suspect of and treat in these cases. And we have, we are fortunate to have rheumatologists in Pune to advise us about the diagnosis and further treatment as well. These are not the days to go ahead with solo therapy of these fever mimics as as well and that's the message thank you very much thank you thank you so much kulkarni sir for this lucid presentation on the beautiful topic of fever mimics uh, sir as you all know is a pediatric infectious disease consultant and has held uh, various posts in regional as well as central ip and the subspecialty chapters uh, sir is a sir has special interest on the quality and rationality of clinical skill pg education and the antibiotic stewardship now may I please request uh, Dr. Kulkarni sir to stop his screen share and uh, also request our next speaker Dr. Bhakti Sarangi sir to start his screen share. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me here.
Yes, uh, so I'll get right to it. I'll just start by sharing my screen. Uh, meanwhile, let me introduce Dr. Bhakti Sarangi, sir. Sir is a professor and head at, head, at, head of pediatric uh, critical care at Bharti Vidyapit Medical College and the hospital. He has over 30 publications at reputed journals under his name, and he has also authored a book. Sir's area of interest are pediatric uh, critical care, respiratory medicine, bronchoscopy, focus, uh, medical That's education, nice. and many others. Uh, over to you, sir. Your slides are visible, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Just a little disclaimer at the beginning that uh, because this is an because of my background as a pediatric intensivist, my cases will have an ICU flavor. But I hope that uh, the message overall and the type of cases that we're seeing gives you a, a good idea of you know how the different presentations of bleeding children can be in the ICU. So I'm going to talk about uh, refractory bleeding in the ICU. It's going to be a case based approach. This is my talk in uh, Pedicon 2024 at Kochi. Uh, when we talk about bleeding in the pediatric intensive care unit, uh, generally we try to quantify the bleeding as mild, moderate or severe. There is a very nice uh, bleeding assessment scale in critically ill children, which is a physician driven diagnostic criteria for severity of bleeding. This was published in 2019. You have children with, who come with different types or amounts of bleeding. You have minimal bleeding where you have just streaks of blood in ET or NG tube. The blood loss is not much. Quantifiable bleeding is less than 1 ml per kg per hour and things like that. Then you have moderate bleeding, which is more than your minimal bleed, but less than the criteria for severe bleeding. This kind of bleeding will not essentially cause any hemodynamic instability or will not cause a significant fall in the hemoglobin that is more than a 20% uh, drop. And the bleeding will be quantified as less than uh, 5 ml per kg per hour. Then obviously you have uh, the severe bleeding. So severe bleeding will essentially lead to at least one organ dysfunction or will lead to hemodynamic instability or will lead to bleeding uh, causing hemoglobin drop for more than 20% within 24 hours. And you can always quantify this bleed as more than 5 ml per kg per hour for more than one hour. So the cases that I'm going to discuss today all have severe bleeding. All were children who had severe bleeding. So let me get right to it. My first case is an 11-year-old girl who was brought with easy fatigability uh, with minimal exertion, progressive pallor since 4 to 5 months and increased work of breathing which was active, aggravated since the last 15 days. Parents gave some history of on and off fever but they were not sure they had never documented. There was no significant family or birth history. She had grown well for her age. On general examination, as you can see, she was mildly tachycardic but definitely tachypneic. Blood pressures were at 10th centile. Hemodynamics seem okay, but she was saturating it, uh, saturating at 80% on room air, which qualifies as respiratory failure for all of us. She was severely pale, uh, but had no edema, actress, sinuses, or lymphadenopathy. Uh, on respiratory system examination, she had bilaterally reduced air entry, bilateral, ba bilateral basal creps, with some subcostal and intercostal retractions. CNS CVS was uh, normal at that point, and per abdomen wise, she had a nice palpable liver below right costal margin. She was started on non-invasive uh, support, respiratory support in the form of HFNC, because we were not sure of uh, the fever history. She was started on a PCV transfusion under diuretic cover, but eventually had to be intubated and mechanically ventilated because of the persistent respiratory distress or the failure. The thing was, post-intubation, she developed profuse oral, nasal and endotracheal bleed. This we had not anticipated and neither had we uh, figured that this, you know, we could be facing such a problem. While labs were awaited, we gave her vitamin K. We were not sure of the INR. We gave her IV and inhaled tranexamic acid, which is a very useful uh, drug in children who bleed, especially in the ICU with severe bleeds. And uh, we also reserved other blood products before, because we were anticipating possibly maybe low platelets or low deranged INR, sepsis, etc. We were not sure what we were dealing with. But her labs came back and you, as you can see, everything apart from the hemoglobin here stands out. So, I mean, 2.8 grams per deciliter is the hemoglobin. The other parameters on hemogram are okay. Little count is normal. If you look at her LFT, LFTs are more or less okay. Bilirubin is slightly raised. But iron profile shows a reduced serum iron, uh, increased TIBC, etc. If you see her PTINR, it's actually normal. Inflammatory markers are uh, CRP is slightly uh, elevated, Procal is slightly elevated. But uh, COVID antibody was negative. We tried to figure out what the cause for the bleed was. The bleeding eventually did reduce, but it did continue for over 24 to 48 hours. 
we did a whole workup for vasculitis because normally we get children in this age group coming with pulmonary bleeds and renal involvement so she didn't have renal renal function and we look for different forms of vasculitis here all her workup for vasculitis workup for heart disease pulmonary hypertension everything else for celiac disease blood and et cultures everything was negative this is her x ray and ct as you can see right the x ray and ct were really bad there was extensive patchy confluent uh, ground glass opacities and consolidations with bilateral lungs and there was interstitial septal thickening as well this was reported as pulmonary hemorrhage and we knew she was bleeding from the et mm -hmm. as all etiological workup was negative we made a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary hemocytosis we did a flexible bronchoscopy and the bile showed presence of hemocytrin laden macrophages consistent with iph the ctpa was also done to rule out any anomalous uh, vessels and it showed bilaterally normal pulmonary arteries iron deficiency anemia was also confirmed bone marrow studies were done and it shows reduced iron stores plus hemocytrin laden macrophages again suggestive of severe iron deficiency anemia so considering that the, uh, the kind of bleed that this was with idiopathic pulmonary hemocytosis she was then pulsed with iv methylprednisolone at 30 mg per kg per day for 5 days with this and frequent suctioning there was reduction in et bleeds and ventilatory requirements and serial x ray showed resolution of previously visible non homogeneous opacities after 4 days she was extubated and discharged after 7 days on low dose oral steroids 15 days post discharge she again developed severe complaints and was electively intubated and ventilated this time we gave her a dose of rituximab which was started as a second line uh, management in addition to corticosteroids after which again bleeding subsided she was successfully extubated and discharged on oral steroid so what do we do when we have a child with bleeding lungs so etiologies may vary based on whether the bleed is localized or generalized when you have a localized bleed or a focal bleed you have to start thinking of localized infection like lung abscess tb pneumonia cystic fibrosis also may cause a localized bleed uh, vascular anomalies such as uh, including cpam av malformations a hemangioma thrombosis pulmonary embolus bleeding diathesis which will call cause local bleed as well as a generalized bleed like thrombocytopenia and von willebrand's disease trauma to one part of the airway or the lung so airway laceration lung contusion secondary trauma suctioning during uh, at suctioning in a ventilated patient foreign body aspiration and miscellaneous other causes like tumors or tuberous sclerosis associated with uh, vessel anomalies but in this case we were bleed uh, uh, dealing with a diffuse pulmonary bleed so diffuse pulmonary bleed can be without capillaritis or with capillaritis here on one side without capillaritis we were dealing with idiopathic pulmonary hemocytosis that's the one we saw and there are many other causes like hyena syndrome which is basically related to cow's milk protein allergy celiac disease coagulopathies some drugs metal stenosis pulmonary heart uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension and uh, chronic heart disease on the other hand you have with capillaritis these are children who come often in this older children and adolescent age group you have children with sle uh, wegner's granulomatosis mpa gpa all of these connective tissue disorders or vasculitis can come with diffuse pulmonary bleed with capillaritis you have to look at certain points in history to figure out what you are dealing with obviously you know fever cough chest pain may indicate pneumonia prolonged fever with cough etc will indicate tb malignancy recurrent cough you may have to look at bronchiectasis with you know uh, excessive uh, sputum <clears throat> production and other things as you can see on the this thing joint pain rash red eye myalgia can lead to connective tissue disorders and vasculitis similarly recurrent otitis media sinusitis sinusitis rhinitis hematuria we can all uh, talk about anka associated vasculitis so you have to get a good history to look at what may be the cause of this pulmonary bleed similarly examination may also give you clues when you look at uh, especially someone who's had a chronic bleeding versus uh, acute or local bleed so you have to look for pallor clubbing growth failure hypertension in hsp you will look like a uh, look for the purpuric skin rash you look for an, uh, evidence of infection etc uh, etc diagnostic evaluation again the test that you do will give you clues in our case we had severe anemia and studies also showed severe anemia everything else was negative then we did a bone marrow we did a bronchoalveolar lavage all of that showed uh, evidence of idiopathic pulmonary hemorrhage so here depending on what you are dealing with you will get uh, what investigations you will do uh, they'll have a certain clinical significance for instance your coagulation profile in lft will talk to you about liver dysfunction or dic renal function may be deranged in pulmorenal syndromes like sle or anka vasculitis your anti dsdna or apla antibodies in sle anka profile which is immune mediated vasculitis 
so similarly anti tt uh, giga or anti uh, endomesial antibodies for celiac disease and obviously a flexible bronchoscopy for uh, bal and hemocytin related macrophages similarly all these particular investigations will point you in a particular uh, direction for certain specific etiologies the management will depend on the cause and severity of bleed the goals of therapy include preventing aspiration stopping the ongoing bleed and treating the primary cause of the general principles obviously will in, include in airway management which will be invasive or non invasive very often it will be invasive in severe bleeds circulation manage shock fluid resuscitation pcv transfusion if there is an infection give antibiotics look for coagulopathy manage that an iv and inhaled tra uh, tranexamic acid is extremely useful now tranexamic acid is something we use very often in our children who had pulmonary bleeds Uh, you can give it IV or inhaled in diffuse alveolar uh, hemorrhage. Inhaled tranexamic acid is very useful in children less than 25 kilos. We give 250 milligrams every six hours for three to four doses. Children more than 25 kilos and adolescents, we give 500 mg inhaled every six uh, hours for three to four doses. Focal bleeds, you'll have to specifically treat the bleed. Either you do a balloon occlusion or use topical airway constrictors, lasers, or embolization of the vessels. Immunosuppressive agents are usually the mainstay for treatment of for DAH with capillaritis. Even in IPH, we use this, uh, similar agents. Induction with either IV MPS or cyclophosphamide, IV IG, rituximab, plasma exchange. These are all options. Long term maintenance will be with low or, uh, low dose oral prednisolone, methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate. The latest thing would be intrapulmonary installation of activated recombinant factor seven, which is extremely extremely expensive, so not really feasible or practical for our patients. This is a case series that we had published in Jan in Indian Pediatrics on ankle associated vasculitis uh, with kidney involvement. All these kids came in the COVID era, and they all of them had pulmonary bleeds with renal involvement. My second case is a ten-year-old male child brought one hour post-accidental strangulation while playing at his residence, and he was gasping and actively convulsing. The incidence was unwitnessed. Child was found unresponsive uh, by the parents. Developmentally, child was apparently normal till then. He had grown well for age. On examination, like I said, he was gasping, actively convulsing. Respiration was irregular, and when the seizures, we controlled the seizures. GCS was poor. Pupils were sluggishly reactive. He had a ligature mark around the neck, present ten to one centimeter. He had to be intubated electively immediately and ventilated. We started on anti uh, ICP measures. All neuroprotective measures were put in place. He was sedated, paralyzed, anti-epileptics, hyperosmolar therapy. We did a CT brain and spine screening, uh, which was normal. He was started on mechanical ventilation. We realized he was requiring uh, extremely high ventilator settings. The next thing he developed profuse ETT bleed and was transfused with one unit PCV. We gave injection tranexamic acid as well as inhaled tranexamic, uh, tranexamic acid. We gave one vitamin K while we labs were awaited, uh, and we made sure we were doing measured suctioning. Echo showed mild to moderate mitral regurg, which could be attributed to capillary, uh, sorry, papillary muscle injury because of the hypoxia. Bedside uh, EG showed moderate encephalopathy. Uh, he was also in shock, required pressure support, as you can see. But the X-ray again, if you Uh, if you can note here, there's bilateral diffuse non-homogeneous opacities in the upper middle zones, showing backwing appearance, which is consistent with uh, consistent with pulmonary edema. Now, we decided to do a CT here because we have heard of an entity called negative pressure pulmonary edema, which we've seen in some of our patients who have uh, upper airway obstruction or severe upper airway obstruction, which leads to negative pressure pulmonary edema. But in this case, there was not just pink frothy sputum, which indicates pulmonary edema. There was frank bleeding happening. So there were multiple confluent areas of widespread consolidation of ground glass opacities on the CT chest. All of them, these findings were consistent with negative pressure pulmonary edema. Now he responded to this above line of management. We didn't have to do anything extra. We optimized his ventilatory settings over 72 hours. As you can see, his pressures uh, got be got better. And after four days of ventilation support, he was extubated. These are the serial X-rays. As you can see, by 72 hours, the chest has cleared off quite a bit. This was a case of negative pressure pulmonary hemorrhage. It's an uncommon complication of upper airway obstruction. The severe negative intrathoracic pressure because of upper airway obstruction causes increased capillary neural pressure that results in mechanical stress on the pulmonary capillaries, causing NPPH. And this subatmospheric inter intrathoracic pressure can also harm the uh, cardiac uh, intracardiac pressures as well as lead to injury to bronchial vasculature, leading to focal hemorrhages in the tracheobronchial tract. Ideally, you have to do a CT chest or maybe MRI. Bronchoscopy may be uh, again done. You may see hemocytin laden macrophages. Uh, the treatment is always supportive care, airway control, hemodynamic stabilization, and determining the nature and source of bleeding, which we did. 
and the use of diuretics and steroids is controversial we did not use either the initially we uh, thought of npp but we did not really use either child was in shock we didn't use any diuretics so this was another very interesting case my third case is a 2 year old girl who had congenital a fibrinogenemia factor 1 deficiency again not very common this was a known case she was diagnosed very early at 1 year of age at 2 years of age she was brought with issue of blunt trauma to the head while playing at home developed a swelling over the left frontal region of uh, the forehead and came with multiple episodes of vomiting and progressive lethargy she also had a uh, had an episode of seizure involving the upper a uh, focal sila focal seizure and past history like i said she was diagnosed very early in life at 6 to 7 uh, days of life where umbilical site uh, stump site bleeding uh, was not stopped she was uh, evaluated at that time and found to have a fibrinogenemia when she came to us this time she had a very low gcs blood pressures were uh, slightly higher view pulse rate was low so this was all suggestive of raised intracranial pressure she was uh, uh, respiration was also not good so we eventually obviously ended up intubating we started all our neuroprotective uh, measures and this child was immediately put to uh, sent to ct as you can see there is a nice uh, edh which is seen in the left frontal region compressing the underlying brain parenchyma this also lead, uh, caused a lot of cerebral edema a lot of intracranial pressure there was also minimal uh, uh, bilateral medial uncle herniation and there was an undisplaced fracture of the anterior part of the parietal bone when we did her labs what we were expecting obviously happened apd and apdt were extremely deranged inr was more than 180 and her quantitative the quantitative fibrinogen was very low less than 139 is what the lab cut off was so it was fair, possibly fairly low now in this case we had to resuscitate her like i said we put uh, gave her anti icp measures we transfused her with cryoprecipitate which is a great source of uh, of uh, this thing for fibrinogen we continued with iv tranexamic acid to reduce the bleeding we gave her vitamin k as well once the fibrinogen levels were brought to beyond 150 mg per deciliter which is acceptable she was taken uh, for emergency left frontal craniotomy and edh evacuation under the cover of cryo ppt and pcv cover she had a couple of episodes of seizures post operatively as well but they subsided with anti epileptics serial fibrinogen level monitoring was done and she was transfused with multiple units of cryoprecipitate however fibrinogen concentrate by itself also is now available uh, which uh, is something we can uh, offer these children as therapy after 48 hours of neuroprotection she was extubated she tolerated well repeat ct showed a reduction in the uh, edh and the findings were now better she was she had no complications by the time she went home even her deficits had reduced she was on oral antiepileptics so whenever you get a child who has a deranged coagulation screen whenever you have an abnormal deranged uh, coagulation screen that is etnr is prolonged or apt uh, with apdt normal you have to think of things like factor 7 deficiency or any particular poisoning with anticoagulant or rodenticide on the other hand if you have apdt prolonged with etnr normal then comes in your hemophilias and von willebrands and all of those uh, factor deficiencies which you will have to look at again apart from that when you have ptnr and eptt prolonged then the cause common causes for this which we see mostly are sep include sepsis liver disease dic and some forms of your factor 2 5 or 10 deficiency as well as fibrinogen deficiency which is what we were dealing with vitamin k deficiency also which we see commonly hemorrhagic disease of newborn will have ptnr and eptt uh, prolonged this is a good uh, clinical decision tree to eight prescription of plasma in critically ill children right you look at whether the child is bleeding or not bleeding if he's bleeding whether the bleed is minimal or moderate or severe and then based on that and based on the baseline condition of the child you can either consider transfusion use your clinical judgment transfuse or just wait and do not transfuse uses of fibrinogen in pediatric population we use fibrinogen concentrate is available like i said otherwise cryoprecipitate is a great source of fibrinogen the idea is whichever condition you're using it try to keep the fibrinogen levels beyond 150 mg per deciliter you have uh, certain conditions where you may use them in this case congenital fibrinogen deficiency sometimes liver disease uh, occasionally trauma if there is hypofibrinogenemia pre surgery or post surgery if there is hypofibrinogenemia uh, con conditions where the happening like dic etc where you are treating the underlying condition also con uh, concurrently right 
tranexamic acid and trauma in surgery just like just like i spoke to you about inhaled tranexamic acid iv tranexamic acid is also something we used commonly as an antifibrinolytic agent hemo anti hemophilic agent and even as a hemostatic agent so we use it very frequently it, the guidelines say that especially in trauma when you use it within the first 3 hours of uh, the trauma it's usually beneficial for the children to reduce the bleeding the dose is given on the slide uh, now it's become part of all guide, uh, trauma guidelines and we see these children so often it's one of the first things we do to stop the bleeding now my fourth case is an 8 year old girl who was an only issue of a non consanguineous marriage she was brought with history of fever on the earlier on the day of admission 103 degree fahrenheit one episode of large quantity vomiting followed by multiple episodes of generalized seizures after which she became unresponsive she had no previous history of rash drug ingestion snake bite trauma seizure episodes in the past she had history of easy bruisability present in the past both parents here in this case were doctors they had evaluated the child with a hemogram a pt uh, inr apt everything all of it was normal but she did have some easy bruisability is what we were told she was developmentally normal growing well when she came uh, when she came to us she was actually referred to us by a center in bhor where she had gone after she had the multiple seizures she was unresponsive there they had intubated her when she came here she was in, uh, she uh, transported here she was in shock intubated unfortunately pupils were already bilaterally fixed and dilated dolls by movements were uh, absent you see the brain stem reflexes are not there uh this was extremely difficult for the parents and for us also but we wanted to try a few things we wanted to give them a diagnosis at least we wanted to have some clue as to what had gone wrong with the child who was completely normal before that particular moment now uh, we did a scan that showed acute intraparenchymal hemorrhage within the brain stem now when we have brain stem bleed it's really difficult along with that she had intraventricular hemorrhage in the third fourth and lateral ventricles and she had extensive edema and transtentorial herniation which we knew clinically we already had uh, signs of when we looked at her lab evaluation her platelets were bang normal hemoglobin had not fallen uh, considerably uh, other lab parameters were okay ptn was slightly deranged but this was not uh, this was probably because of shock we did not really uh, have to do anything this kind of ptn does not really cause such severe bleeding uh parents were counseled we we told them we were not sure and we maybe we should look at a bleeding uh, profile and talk with her and send a whole genome sequence whole exome sequencing this was consent was taken and uh, these samples were sent and that revealed glansman's thromboasthenia so whenever you have a child uh, who you are evaluating for bleeding uh, look at the peripheral blood smear when you are looking at the platelets always if the platelet count is low and with platelet count low you have large platelets your possible diagnosis include itp which is extremely common or bernard spieler syndrome which is again a platelet function defect which with thrombocytopenia on the other hand if you have a low platelet count and normal size platelets then look at the possible diagnosis of uh, aplastic anemia or leukemia or megacaryocytic thrombocytopenia this is a situation where we had normal platelet counts right on th these situations you may have isolated platelets or platelets and clump isolated platelets will be seen in situations like glansman thromboasthenia von willebrand's disease and platelets and clumps will be seen in your type 2b von willebrand's disease so this glansman thromboasthenia we have a few patients following up with us is basically a platelet function disorder caused by dysfunction of this gp2b3a uh, complex which basically helps platelet aggregation it links the platelets to fibrinogen and at the set, uh, site of injury vascular injury and promotes uh, platelet aggregation and clotting if platelet function is not good then obviously the bleeding is going to continue and these children tend to bleed to death with uh, severe bleeding often now the thing about uh, glansman thromboasthenia is that even if you transfuse platelets the problem is you may stop bleeding with transfusing platelets but these children are at a risk of developing allo antibodies uh, to those platelets and your platelet transfusion may deem useless if you use them again and again so here people do uh, use recombinant factor 7 for smaller bleeds and they save the platelet transfusions for larger bleeds or life threatening bleeds the recommended dose for recombinant factor 7a is 90 mg uh, microgram per kg or, which is diluted in normosilin and given over 2 to 6 hr intervals but like i said the cost is extremely high again this is a similar clinical decision tree to aid prescription of platelets in uh, clinic uh, critically ill children my last case today was a 7 year old male admitted with complaints of uh, pain abdomen since 12 days yellowish discoloration of skin and sclera since 9 days vomiting since 3 days and low grade fever since 2 days 
he had altered sensorium parents uh, i mean he was sorry sensorium was initially normal but parents did give uh, some history of alteration in the sleep cycle now it's pretty clear this child had a hep- uh, hepatitis we were not sure of the cause he had already stage 1 uh, hepatic encephalopathy looked at his investigations pti and nerves uh, deranged liver function was grossly deranged if you look at his bilirubin it was, it was extremely high 39 mg per deciliter he had started to become slightly encephalopathic he was admitted to the icu started on liver supportive measures including n acetylcysteine and all the other things we spoke to our hepatologist a uh, double volume plasma exchange was planned now this child when this was a complication that happened in our icu when we did a uh, hd catheter insertion he we ended up causing a pneumothorax uh, sorry hemothorax as you can see in the x ray lot of effusion when we tapped this effusion there was frank blood this was a hemothorax on the right hand side you can see a point of care lung usg photo the black area in the middle that is the hemothorax that is all the blood so we did a tap this child deteriorated quite badly after the hemothorax uh, and we knew the inr was deranged we were doing it under ffp cover but considering the liver underlying liver pathology he bled uh, quite a bit so diagnostic tap was done suggestive of blood in thorax icd was inserted two units of pcv and ffp were transfused hypotension persisted he was started on noradrenaline infusions there was a lot of blood loss so we transfused lot of uh, prbcs and we have persistent blood loss the blood loss just was not stopping we decided to call our pediatric surgeon as well as the cath lab for ruling out any bleeder on diagnostic angiogram and thankfully our interventional radiologist was very very uh, cooperative he was in fact on it right away we did a diagnostic angiogram and it showed a nice bleeder originating from the right subclavian so the right subclavian artery rent had happened while we were inserting the hd catheter now they tried balloon inflation to control the bleeding four such cycles were repeated for 10 minutes but the oozing persisted now when this didn't work what they eventually tried as you can see in the video there was a nice stent graft that was deployed to stop the bleeding and eventually that graft as you can see is there and the bleeding has stopped that bleeder has gone and after that finally we started getting reduced uh, better hemodynamics and reduced bleeding so this child was shifted back to the icu continued mechanical ventilation still require a lot of blood and ffp icd output decreased hemodynamic parameters improved he was extubated successfully after 72 hours in fact his whole blood volume eventually ended up getting exchanged in this whole process he had to be started on aspirin because of the stent graft in place his liver functions actually gradually improved and he was discharged from the hospital after 24 days of hospital stay recently came for follow up was doing very well so when you have stuff like this in the icu which is very common because we do so many invasive procedures these are common complications especially hemothorax uh, because of uh, uh, rent in the subclavian or even the carotid for that matter uh, you, the management of these things will depend on the grade of injury so if this is a low grade intubal injury or uh, or arterial occlusions we uh, where no limb ischemia is seen and no hemodynamic instability is there we can just just do repeat, serial ctas or ultrasounds and uh, give anticoagulation open up uh, open approach is used in uh, more uh, i mean this is the most common indication is vessel transection or greater than 50% uh, vessel laceration endovascular approach which is what we did is used in situations where your injury segment is less than 3 cm or there is partial disruption of the arterial wall which was seen in our case in this child we gave a massive transfusion so whenever you have trauma cases who are bleeding profusely you use massive transfusion uh, protocol massive transfusion when you give the uh, prbc transfusion of 50% of more than uh, total blood volume in 3 hours or 100% total blood volume in 3 hours or prbc transfusion of more than 10% of total blood volume per minute so depending on the assessment of your blood loss you will decide how much blood is to be given now in this situation whenever we have bleeding children lot of complications can occur including coagulopathy shock acidosis we have to make sure we not only restore circulating uh, blood volume and administer components that uh, re- make sure the hemostasis is maintained or return to normal so we use a strategy of permissive hypotension also so as long as the end organ perfusion is maintained and limit crystalloid resuscitation which causes more problems such as coagulopathy clot disruption and cellular dysfunction and the balanced transfusion strategy which we follow is usually we give prbc to ffp to platelets in a ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1 or 2 is to 1 is to 1 to represent the whole blood loss adequately 
surgical control obviously will be a definitive therapy to control the blood loss so our, these are our targets for resuscitation hb more than 8 grams per deciliter fibrinogen more than 100 mg per deciliter pt ratio less than 1.5 and platelets more than 75000 excluding tbi where we would prefer more than 1 lakh so in summary managing refractory bleeds is challenging in our uh, icu or critical care settings you are always important to classify the bleed using the basic protocol stabilize the abc's first consider use of tranexamic acid in trauma even diffuse alveolar hemorrhage you can use inhaled tranexamic acid use local measures to stop bleeding where applicable i haven't spoken about local measures over here like basic things like compression use of uh, botrocloid use of drops all of those things keep blood and blood products ready and for use as indicated manage the cause of bleed and involve other disciplines where in, in trauma and especially where they could be used like surgeons or your intervention radiologists thank you very much uh thank you so much dr bhakti sarangi sir for this wonderful talk on refractory uh, bleeding in pico i'm sure it will surely help all the intensivists in their routine practices may i now please request you to stop this uh, screen share and also i would like to request dr our next speaker dr thank sunil godbole sir uh, to start your screen share Dr Sunil Godbole sir is a developmental pediatrician with extensive experience and expertise in the field he also had been a national secretary to GDPP for 2022-23 and a faculty to IIP action plan 16 uh, development for all he has various articles in national uh, he has presented various articles in national and international journals and also authored various books a parenting is such a difficult task these days thanks to the shrinking families shortness of time and excessive exposure to the virtual world sir is going to enlighten us on this parenting journey let us hear out what he has to say over to you sir uh, thank you iip pune and uh, dr shirish and the whole team for allowing me to present with in this uh, august gathering um, my topic at gdp uh, at uh, pedicon in kochi was parenting journey for di differently abled children from infancy to adolescence but here for the sake of the pediatrician i'm going to just for the sake of convenience i have to discuss about parenting journey from infancy to adolescence and i tell you assure you about one part that when i was preparing for this presentation it was a journey for me as well ellen galinsky has said uh, developed this six stages of parenthood in which we all are going through so i'm going to discuss the in the next few minutes i'm try to save the time for the next speaker as well by discussing in few minutes about this symposium part depending on four parts the child's needs what are the parents responses which we pediatrician are going to tell the parents that is where the whole crux comes then what are the developmental links with that and lastly what the pediatrician job in this case so let's start with phase 1 this is the phase in the of the infancy when the image making stage of the parents and this in the image making stage this is the only time uh, i like this sentence only only time when the child ate whatever the mother wanted for dinner without complaining so this is the first stage when the image making stage it is in utero the timing is the timing is minus 9 to 0 months the first 1000 days the first 9 months the 270 days in this period during the pregnancy the parents start forming oh i am going to have a baby then they form and reform the images of what i am going to do to manage this baby then what are the requirements and economical and everything that starts coming into the mind what the child at that time thinking is are mujhe bother mat karo chalna to jo ko chala not to bother get of the world yet undisturbed growth i just wanted to be in the mother's womb and yahan pe mother by physical ways and by mental ways this next generation is having lots of stress and that is the importance of this image making stage when the child's growth has to be really managed quite comfortably and that is sometimes where the things are missing what are the parents parents primary responsibility at that time preparation of parenting is that is the time they are going to start thinking about and we as a pediatrician we as a doctors we as a counselors we need to help them to develop their ideas about what it will be like to be a parent and what type of parenting they want to too good parenting is also too or soft parenting is also dangerous and too hard parenting is obviously dangerous so the parent starts to think about this and we need to direct them at that stage in this stage what are the development links the maternal nutrition maternal infection and uh, uh, stress for it which is uh, very important uh, in this case and that is the time we we have to be careful and then the congenital anomaly genetics everything comes with the developmental links 
while thinking of the image making stage before zero days. What are the pediatrics job? Preparing for preparation. I like this sentence. Every time a baby is born, a new set of parents is born. And instead of uh, rambling about health issues about baby and importance, especially when the child is born, this is the time I'm talking, when we visit for that uh, first day and what we talk, your baby is well there, then you have to think of, we always think of our own puppy pet. So we start thinking about vaccination and the well baby visits and what is most important, you should come to us again and again. But that is the time what they are, they're in a very different set of mindset. So instead of rambling about all these things, just look and listen for their anxieties. And if you are help, going to help them on them, they are going to be really helpful because this listening will lead to the where they will become your family, you will become their family pediatrician for forever. Just those two minutes of listening to their anxieties of parenting. And that is why I think the importance of today's topic. Next come the first two years. Huh? As most of you are gone through this parenting, you know keeping a baby for sleep and making it sleep. So how it looks and how it feels a ticking bomb and how the uh, very energetic child creates problems for the parents. You as a parent have gone through this phase and going through this phase probably. This is a period of attachment. Child needs everything from the parents. Child needs security, stimulation. We forget about this stimulation. And what we give them is stimulation, a mobile screen to give. And that creates a whole lot of problems. So this is the time the child needs to explore the world from parent's shoulder and not from the mobile's window. So that is the child's need. And what is the parent need? Catering. So we are catering, we are helping them to anticipate the difficulties of having to care for. They are always worried about it. 24 by 7 parenting is a, is a very tough journey to have. Going through the shock of actual experience of it and then the child care now and then all that's very, very important. What are the development links? Again, nutrition, infection, vaccination. That's what we pediatricians are working about. But along with that, cerebral palsy, developmental disorders, early recognition of autism, that are all the areas of this type of time when the parents are worried, anxious about these issues. And their Google university is teaching them all of them and we need to be careful on them. So what is a pediatrician's job? Parents have lots and lots of questions and issues about the development of the child and we are not giving them much time for that this is the time we should start thinking about it instead of direct orders this is the time we need to hand over the parents to face the challenges posed by a rapidly growing changing baby the baby in the last month is not the baby today and they're having lots of issues about that so a navigator's job not a driver's job you do this that's what not the this journey uh, parenting uh, uh, generation like they need Huh? What you can do, we are there to help you and that is the part we need to do. So we have to tell them, we always say that you are making so many mistakes. But it's not so. They are not making the mistakes because they don't care. They are just making mistakes for because they are care so deeply. They are very much connected with the baby and that is why they are making mistakes and we have to be really gentle about it. Now the third stage, the authority stage. When you are trying to look nice, this uh, again a um, cartoon which I like the most here but you haven't slept for this now next five years are the sleepless nights for the parents every now and then the child is going through time I think we have lost the uh, connection of Dr. Uh, Godbole, sir.
must be a problem from his side. Looks like. Yes, sir. Internet problem. Yes, Commonest problem is internet problem. Yes, Are you called him? Sir had some issue with the internet. Uh, sir is joining in uh, within a minute. In a few seconds, he, sh he should be there. We are we all are extremely sorry for this inconvenience. Please just wait for a few seconds. I think we'll start with the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker uh, for the day is Dr. Pramod Zoksar. Uh, may I request Dr. Zoksar to please start his presentation? Mm. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Zoksar needs no introduction. Uh, sir is a senior pediatrician with nearly four decades of clinical practice. Sir was president of Central IP in 2016 and is advisor and consultant at various organizations, including UNICEF. Uh, with an experience of delivering innumerable lectures on national and international platform, I can say that we all are lucky to have him here with us today. Sir is talking on fever in tropic, tropics, emergency care management, and without wasting any time, uh, uh, let us hear what sir has to say. Over to you, sir. Yes, yes. Hello. Is possible that... Ah, I'm very sorry for this uh, unexpected uh, event. Uh, I hope everybody is able to hear me. So I'll yes, start sir. with this authority. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Sunil, this is developmental error. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> okay. Obstacles are there, and that is parenting. Yes. So yes. Uh, there has to be some loss of control. Then only you can have the part. And I'm trying to be consistent to uh, maintain that control. So the development links. Uh, this is the time from two to five years. Most most of the developmental disorders come with pictures. Is a common day-to-day -day problem with the pediatricians, and we need to be remembering this uh, every now and then. Now, this is the time we always remember that the silence is golden unless you have a toddler who is very quiet and that is very dangerous. So what is a pediatrician's job? Again, we are educators now. We are not only doctor. Doctor, the actual meaning is a preacher, one who tells people. 
We have to tell the parents how to set boundaries, how to be consistent in the behavior. And then the checkup for the understanding of the parent. Most of the parents, we give the um, uh, people like Pramod Zok, but what uh, parents do? Are they understanding it? That is very important. And this is the time we should tell the parents a very important concept that every child behavior is telling you something. It is always job to see the behavior as information, not an aggravation. Uh, my child is giving me a lot of trouble. No, actually it want, wants to tell something about himself and which we are unable to understand. This is the real part of it. Next part that goes into is, is the post are the interpretative stage. Now, this you can understand what is going to happen. My room isn't messy. It has just everything on display. That is a typical 5 to 10 years child who is vibrant with energy. He is least interested of what is happening around. And that is the interpretive stage. And this is the time child is gaining understanding. But this is the most important time. He is understanding the family's values and expectations, which we are not interested about. Are we teaching those things to our children? And we need to teach them about that. What is the parent's primary responsibility? Interpret what the child is experiencing, what his needs are, what her needs are, and then gradually imposing to expose to the world outside. I mean, now we have to start shifting the child towards the world around. And parents start their answers by answering the children's questions. This is the time they ask lots of questions. And what we say, Gappa Ves. And that is a very interesting parental uh, paradox. In the early days, when the child is not talking, we ask the child to talk. And when the child is talking, what we say? Chub bhai. So this is a paradox in this interpretive stage. I wanted to understand. Till now, what we say? The parenting has to be controlling the child. But now if we continue the control after five years, it is going to get pressure, 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 and it's going to burst like a volcano. All these learning difficulties, ADHD, screen access are the time, typical problem of development at this time. And what is the parent pediatrician job? Coaching. This is the time we tell them that the tube approach is not allowed. If you don't allow the child to get loosen after five years, it is going to go into a rebellion or the volcano. And that is the common story that the parents will say, Kal tak mera bachcha sun raha tha. Aaj kya ho gaya usko? Okay? We are trying to control the child a lot. So, this is the time what we have to tell the parents, support, don't threaten. So I will put into boarding. We don't do like that. And the children know what the parents can do and they can take, take care of that. Now comes the fifth and interesting stage, the interdependent stage. This is the time when you are trying to tell your team that you are wrong. You are talking to a wall. And that is a very interesting time that it tend to 17 years. What is the time this time? This is you have to be on the sideline. What the child needs? Loving guidance. But Jada bolo mat. I am on my own. You should not talk to me much. This is what we are going to say. And child's primary need is a loving guide, guidance. What are the parental needs? The practical practice. Practical practice. It's time to start nudging them towards the edge of the nest. The child is like a baby of a bird. They bear that uh, bird is going to fly off. Are we preparing the child for that flight? And then we have to refine their training so that they can be ready to fly off. Now is the time the final opposite way. The adolescent storm, addiction, that is a time development report. While what we have to do? Concerting job. Now open up, become supportive. Our previous generation is to now you become friend of the child, converse their respect with the maturity and allowing them to say no in spite in uh, specifically in view of the addictions part. When they need you, be there, but not as a parent, but as a friend. That is the motto. And the last six stage. Probably not in the um, capacity of a pediatrician, but as a parent, you all are going to go through this phase. You must be going through two gifts we should give our children. One is roots and the other is wings. And this is 17 years plus. They now need a space. They need to be allowed to experience their independence by making their own decisions with a hands up approach from parents. We need not be mingling again and again in their what they are doing. While the parents' primary responsibility now is support. Whatever they require, what are success and failure they go to, they should know that somebody is waiting for me. And the parents are there to help me, irrespective of whatever the world says. That safety net is the parental job. So the development league, this is a time of emptiness syndrome. I think few of my friends over here are going through that. And that is the time now the parent reverses. Again, the child wants to go out of it and we are not ready for that. What is the pediatrician job? Actually, it ends years. It now is a parent job as a pediatrician. 
but listening with open mind, getting curious, asking questions, and trying not to trying to control is called the volcano eruption. That's not we are going to do. So that is the part. So parenting team, watch them fly. They worked hard for this. So this is the time we started enjoying it. That the child is okay. The child is taking its own flight. Is it wrong in it? Absolutely not. And that is what we should be prepared. So I was just rambling through uh, with an um, unfortunate break in the whole story with these six stages of image making in the pregnancy, nurturing in the first two years, developing that authority in the two to five years, leaving that authority gradually the five, five to 13 years, becoming friend with the children by interdependent time, that is adolescent time, and then the departure. The child is going to have its own flight. Are we allowing them? I think I stop you on that. It's saying that parenting is a job over here, all the pediatrics over there, to meet for the IIP program at on 7th April about the World Autism Awareness. We're going to discuss about the parenting of our different labor children. Thank you all for listening and accepting my problem over here. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you so much, Kotar, uh, for this. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Godwale, sir, uh, for this crisp and uh, beautiful presentation topic. Surely it will help all of us, not only as a pediatrician, but also as a parent. Uh, now we'll start with Dr. Zoksar's lecture. Uh, may I request Dr. Zoksar to please start his screen share? Yes. I hope I am audible and visible. Uh, okay, right. Everything fine, Vinod? Yes, sir. Okay. So Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay, okay. I will just, uh, you know, give a brief account of what I spoke at Kochi. And that was a talk on fever in the tropics and uh, the pediatric emergency challenges. It was a long talk, but I will, you know, cut short because I am sure after listening to all this, all our IAP members are now likely to get some auditory fatigue and maybe fatigue of the gray cells. So just remember that we are IAP members. You can see these three alphabets I always put in red color because these are intelligence wise average pediatricians. Okay. I am intelligence wise average, but the talk was, you know, by Bhakti was for highly intelligence pediatricians. Okay. So half of it went over my head, but doesn't matter. I will try to make my talk very simple. And uh, just give me a moment so that this screen moves further. Okay, okay. Very good. Okay. So first, you know, one important point. What is tropical fever? So remember the tropical fevers are infections which are unique to the tropical and the subtropical regions. Okay. And some of these occur throughout the year. And some are seen in the rainy and the post rainy season. So this is very important. Look at this graph of the uh, globe. And you can see... That in the center is the equator from our geography knowledge. About for 23.5 degrees on the north, it is the Tropic of Cancer. Below the equator, 23.5 degrees, it is Tropic of Capricorn. So in between, whatever comes is tropics. So if you see, you know, India is uh, actually tropical and uh, subtropical together. So what you should remember that most of India is subtropical. So there is, you know, very hot summer, humid, rainy, winter, everything is there. So the point is that the concern about the high prevalence and the morbidity and the mortality, which is caused by some of these infections, and there is overlapping clinical presentation. You don't know whether it is enteric, whether it is, uh, you know, scrub, whether it is uh, something else, and then whether it is dengue, and then uh, difficulties are there in arriving at a diagnosis. So these are some common tropical fevers, okay? So you know dengue, typhoid, malaria, leptospirosis. Uh, these are very common. There are common but considered less often like scrub typhus. Then there are some ones which are not so common but you cannot ignore them like brucellosis. There are some which are uncommon but you cannot, you know, forget. Uh, like of course, uh, amoebiasis, Japanese encephalitis, rabies. And then there are newer ones like Zika and Nipah. This is only for you to understand. And there is an Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine, 
wherein uh, the percentage of all these uh, illnesses was found out, where dengue was the topmost, followed by scrub typhus, followed by meningitis and encephalitis and malaria and next like that. Okay. So now why you need to know about the tropical fevers? Because they are the common cause of acute febrile illness and sometimes the reason for PUO. Of course, PUO means pyrexia of unknown origin, but that is also, you know, the full form is when a patient goes to pediatrician of unknown origin. So that is also another full form of PUO. So remember that uh, tropical fevers, the first approach in the emergency care, okay, is to assess what is called as the skew sofa score. Nothing great about it. Check the respiratory rate, mentation and the systolic blood pressure. So if the RR is more than 22, mentation is altered and the blood pressure is less than 100, systolic. These are actually the criteria given for adults. There is nothing like a pediatric uh, SOFA score. But just try to remember that you have to assess the stability of the patient first. So remember the mnemonic stops. Look at the sensorium, temperature, oliguria, perfusion and the sugar. So when you look at these five, you will come to know in general whether this chap is serious or not serious. And ask four questions to yourself. Whether this child is serious, whether I need to hospitalize him, if I do not hospitalize, he will die, and whether I need to do anything urgently. So all these four questions have to be asked. So look for localizing signs and symptoms. And uh, from the history investigations, you go to the treatment. Okay. So as it is tropical, Remember, there are certain T's. So, you ask for tick bite. At least uh, see whether the fellow is coming from that area, territory, and whether there is history of travel. Okay. And very important is, you know, many times to pediatricians, patients come after they go to a general physician or a practitioner. So, ask. In case if this chap has already given uh, cephalosporins, then, you know, if he has received it for more than five days, unlikely to be uh, typhoid. If the adult physician or the ones have given doxycycline, less likely to be scrub typhus. If the child has received erythromycin for five days, again, less likely to be typhoid or leptospirosis or scrub typhus. And uh, in case if the child has, uh, uh, you know, given, been given chloroquine, then malaria is unlikely. And then if he has, you know, received naproxen and the fever has settled, then it is, uh, you know, likely to be something related to non-infectious fevers. So, take the history of antibiotics, drug history properly. I will not elaborate the cases totally at all. Just tell you what was found out in these cases for the want of time. Just remember this child who was three-year-old had fever for four days and there, except for the fever, there were no clinical clues. So, when the fever is undifferentiated, you don't know what is going on. You, you know, the child doesn't come to you saying that, sir, I have dengue fever, I have a tropical fever. So, from top to toe, you have to examine. So, remember all those T's. So, temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure and capillary refill time, you have to check. Look out for the tense fontanel and also the tight neck so that you rule out uh, meningitis. Look at the throat and the teeth. But remember, the tympanic membrane is also very, very important. And it is said that you must examine twice the number of ears as the number of patients coming to the OPD. Of course, it is obvious because every child has two ears. And uh, please use this otoscope because it is very impressive instrument. And once you use it, then uh, children also, you know, some of my children, they tell their parents, oh, tisri aankh wala doctor hai uske paas jane ka hai. So it really helps. So tomorrow, if some representative comes to you and uh, asks you, sir, what can I do for you? Ask him to, you know, gift one good otoscope so that, you know, you always keep it on your table. Of course, if you already have it, start using it. Look at the tender cervical nodes. Look out for tachypnea, tender abdomen, liver, spleen, and McBurney's tenderness. You know, Recently, I had a child who came for presentation like appendicitis and turned out to be dengue fever. So, that McBurney's tenderness can very well deceive you. And then look at Totaram. Totaram is the other name for the male genital. So, rule out all the other causes. Not that you have to concentrate only on tropical fevers because, as I said, you have to see that other causes are ruled out. Turn the child on the back, rule out cellulitis, totally undress the child and look out for rash, swelling, joint swellings, HR and so on. So, when you are identifying this enemy, in case if there is diffuse erythema or a blanching rash, think of dengue. If there is an HR, think of scrub typhus. Conjunctival congestion, think of leptospira. If there is pallor, think of malaria. If there is jaundice, think of either hepatitis or leptospirosis. If there is hepatomegaly or splenomegaly or lymphadenopathy, 
uh, you have to think of related diseases. And if there is edema, you can think of dengue. So there are clinical clues for these uh, tropical fevers. And then remember that all these tropical fevers have some syndromic presentation. Syndromic means what? Suppose if you come to Pune, what is the syndromic approach in Pune? The people are very reserved. They will not appreciate other person easily. They will sleep between 1 to 4 in the afternoon. So when you take all these things together, that's a syndrome. That's the Punekar syndrome. If you go to Nagpur, they will welcome you. They will say, Jogi, you cannot go without taking lunch at my place. Take this orange burfi. That is Nagpur. If you go to Bombay, you know, they will be little free. You know, um, they will pay you very well. And they are little free to talk. And they will appreciate uh, fast. And of course, there are some other things also. So anyway, so these are syndromes of each of the cities. Similarly, fever with rash, there will be some conditions. Fever with thrombocytopenia, some conditions. Fever with jaundice, fever with renal failure, fever with encephalopathy, fever with respiratory distress. So it's a syndromic approach. So don't just pinpoint one disease and that will give you the clue. So if there are undifferentiated fevers, you don't know what's going on. It could be malaria, as I said, subtrifus, leptospira, typhoid, dengue. So you don't concentrate only on typhoid or dengue, but take it as a syndromic approach when it comes to emergency care. So there is a child of dengue fever. I will not go in the details of uh, this child. It's a routine child with dengue fever. And uh, you have checked everything. And then uh, this particular child, when you were treating, you get an emergency call. And on day four, he has become drowsy. There is capillary leak. So you must remember certain challenges when you are dealing with dengue. So check pulse rate and volume and peripheral pulses, blood pressure, pulse pressure, capillary refill, heart rate, respiratory rate, suggestive of pleural effusion, abdominal girth for ascites, urinary output is mandatory for determining the fluid intake and output, and then sensorium and hepatomegaly and rash and so on. So you have to monitor vital signs in dengue. Remember this formula of 20 of the signs to identify the high risk cases of dengue fever. So there is a rise in pulse by 20, if it is so. If there is fall in the upper blood pressure by 20, there is rise in the hematocrit by 20% or more, which suggests hypolemia. Rapid fall in the platelets to less than 20,000 between 3 to 8 days. And petechial count of more than 20 in 1 inch of the tourniquet test. So all these, these are the signs to identify high risk cases of dengue fever. So diagnosis of dengue is mainly clinical. Treatment is symptomatic and you have to check the serial blood counts. I need not tell this August gathering. So falling platelet and rising hematocrit is not a good sign. And you all know what are the warning signs and how to treat the child you know, uh, by the fluid therapy. So what are the emergency challenges in dengue? One is fluid therapy, when there are only warning signs and when the child is in shock. So this fluid therapy basically is a challenge when the child is bleeding when the child has encephalopathy and when the child is going into hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. So you all must inform the parents about the warning signs like abdominal pain and tenderness, persistent vomiting, clinical fluid accumulation, mucosal bleed, lethargy or restlessness and liver enlargement. So this you must tell on your OPD paper and also tell them about the need for hospitalization. Of course, suspected fever of dengue with thrombocytopenia one may admit, depending on other situations, high hemoconcentration, warning signs and bleeding manifestations. But don't, uh, you know, uh, induce fear in the mind of the child or the, rather the parents by telling that the platelets have gone down, you must uh, admit the child and all. So do not induce thrombocytophobia. So don't make them afraid of this, uh, you know, uh, platelet count. So you are all aware of certain things. So remember, if the hematocrit is rising with worsening vitals, then further fluid boluses are needed. But you can see, in case if the hematocrit is falling with worsening of the vitals, then there could be some occult hemorrhage. So most of these points are known to you. I'm just focusing. So there are certain don'ts of dengue management in the emergency care. So do not use corticosteroids because they're associated with risk of bleeding in the GI tract or hyperglycemia. Do not give platelet transfusion for a low platelet count. I told you, do not uh, be afraid of this thrombocytopenia to a great extent. And then do not give half normal saline as maintenance fluids. Do not assume that IV fluids are necessary. You can prefer oral fluids if they are tolerable. And use only minimum amount of IV fluids to keep the patient well perfused. And what are the do's of dengue management? Do tell the outpatients when to return and do recognize the critical period. 
and closely monitor the fluid intake and output and recognize and treat early shock okay there is another case of dengue itself which came with uh, you know acute onset of fever altered sensorium and convulsions and this particular child uh, had uh, severe dengue with encephalitis and you should know that there are some neurological manifestations of dengue like encephalitis meningitis encephalopathy edem then polyneuropathy intracerebral hemorrhage and guillain syndrome so whenever there is a child now this is a syndromic approach rash and thrombocytopenia so it could be dengue it could be rickettsial infection it could be meningococcal it could be falciparum malaria or it could be leptospira or it could be measles or any other viral exanthem okay so this is a syndromic approach another child who is eight year old boy with fever and convulsions ultimately uh, you know he turned out to be a child uh, of uh, acute encephalopathy syndrome and uh, he was a case of malaria he had come from africa and he came to pune and then there was a history of travel which you should never forget rarely of course malaria we have stopped seeing for so many months now but sometimes you do get them so in case if you do not get uh, falciparum on the smear what are the causes of smear negative malaria that's one of the challenge so the challenge is because if there is a recent drug treatment or if the fellow has not adequately examined the blood film or there is uh, too much of reliance on the thin film and uh, the thick film has not been examined or in cerebral malaria the parasites are sequestered deep inside the capillaries of the organs therefore often the malaria parasite is negative so you should always see that if you get malaria parasite negative once do not stop at that check it for the second time and remember there are three main types of severe malaria severe anemia cerebral malaria and metabolic acidosis so remember when there is sudden severe jaundice sudden and severe then it indicates hepatic vasculopathy in a child with malaria okay and uh, do not forget to ask the history of travel and i told you if one smear is negative repeat the smear and person behind the microscope is important very important and one important thing is if a child with cerebral malaria is convulsing first treat the blood glucose check for hypoglycemia because hypoglycemia is the most common cause which is untreated in a unconscious child coming to you with cerebral malaria remember cerebral malaria the child is uh, comatose but involvement is symmetrical as opposed to japanese encephalitis where involvement may not be symmetrical okay and you know that the uh, female anopheles mosquito is the one responsible for uh, this uh, malaria why female anopheles and why not male that is the question which my examiner used to ask me remember the eggs and all they grow well in the human blood okay so blood is a nurturing thing for these that's why it is a female male usually survives on the nectar and other things and the fruit juices and all but then female anopheles is the one responsible okay and you know that uh, culex uh, you know again the names of the culex surprisingly are associated with names of the gods culex vishnui culex para vishnui i don't know why but then it is responsible for ze and filariasis you know that aedes is associated with dengue and there is the tiger mosquito and chikungunya and remember that uh, another case uh, tropical fever that is salmonella typhi again i will not go in the details but remember if the friend that means you think that he is responding to uh, ceftriaxone child is uh, improving improving fine but if the fever doesn't go down despite seven days of therapy what all will you think of number one you first must admit him then look out for complications look out for thrombophlebitis look out for drug fever and the uh, this uh, hemophagocytic syndrome so here the child will look sicker he will look be shocky okay tachypnea will be there hepatosplenomegaly will be increased there will be abdominal distension so all these points you know particularly if there are some problems then you have to be very very careful and remember that uh, in a child who has uh, this uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis there are some criteria like fever you know beyond 38.5 splenomegaly bicytopenia hypertriglyceridemia hyperferritinemia and all if there are six out of eight criteria then this is called hlh okay of course this is not you know the thing it is bhakti sarangi's area he has to go in the picu okay so i told you that this is the case where you must know that the friend is no more a friend responding to ceftriaxone but he is turning into an enemy what you have to remember all thrombocytopenias are not dengue fever all positive vidal tests are not enteric fever okay 
and uh, when the child does not respond to conventional treatment look beyond routine infections okay and another child who came with fever unsteadiness and lymphadenopathy and uh, horizontal nystagmus on both the sides truncal and peripheral ataxia and this particular child turned out to be a case of uh, scrub typhus okay this particular child had developed a rash which was discrete pale red blood and then maculopapillary initially on the extremities and spread to the entire body including palms and the soles and uh, this scrub typhus there was another child which came with respiratory distress and it was ARDS related to scrub typhus okay uh, so remember the complications of scrub typhus which can come in the you know ICU like meningoencephalitis myocarditis hepatic dysfunction pneumonitis GI bleed and so on so always always look out for an HR that is why you must remember another T that is total undressing. But one of my friends in Sangli, he had given a blanket order to the receptionist for total undressing. And I remember even medical representatives, you know, used to go inside, uh, you know, with only limited clothes. Okay, that don't do that. Only restrict the order only for the children. Anyway, that's a, in a lighter vein. The point is that total undressing. Why? Because this child who was only three and a half month old and uh, came with respiratory distress, had HR at, you know, a place below the, you know, you can see in the middle uh, slide behind the ear. Because, you know, when the small child sleeps on the bed, the tick bites from the bottom. And some of them get in under the scrotum. Some of them, you know, go for defecation in the fields. And when the tick is at the tip of the grass, then that bites from below. So it goes under the scrotum. So there are definite areas, but usually these areas are not seen unless you totally undress the child. So here also, remember that it's a syndromic approach. So a child coming to you with fever and ARDS, it could be scrub, it could be falciparum malaria, it could be H1N1, it could be leptospira and so on. So remember that it's a syndromic approach. And another child, a three-year-old child, which came with uh, myalgia and bilateral conjunctival suffusion and lipatomegaly, this child finally turned out to be a child with uh, leptospirosis. And uh, when you get abrupt onset of fever, chills and conjunctival suffusion, headache, myalgia, jaundice, and uh, this conjunctival suffusion and muscle tenderness are most notable in the calf and the lumbar region. Okay, so you should, uh, you know, uh, subject this particular child to different investigations. There are many serologic methods are the mainstay of diagnosis, and uh, uh, you know maybe we will discuss this particular topic at some other uh, time because there is a lot to be discussed about leptospirosis, the topic which we usually do not discuss. But remember that. Uh, when you get fever with multi-organ dysfunction, then you can think of either sepsis or falciparum or leptospira or scrub typhus. You can see the same causes will have, you know, uh, different uh, place in their presentation. And that's why you must be very, very careful. So diagnose it as a syndrome. Do not diagnose it as one and one only. And this uh, case, nine-year-old boy with fever and convulsions. Again, with acute onset of fever, altered sensorium and convulsions. This triad means it is acute encephalitis syndrome. Okay. So here, this particular child turned out to be a case of Japanese encephalitis. It was confirmed by CSF IgM ELISA. And uh, you remember that MRI is very, very important. How to remember the changes which occur in the you know brain? So remember this word sentence. If her tempo is good, we can have thali in Japan. What do you mean by that? means her mean herpes in herpes it is temporal lobe involvement and thali is thalamus and that is japanese japanese encephalitis okay so remember that uh, whenever you have uh, mri picture having involvement of thalamus it is japanese encephalitis and in one more case where there was a febrile encephalopathy uh, and uh, there again now this syndromic approach says that it could be encephalitis meningitis scrub cerebral malaria or typhoid encephalopathy. So you can see that all these five, six different presentations have different causes. And if there is a sudden involvement with respiratory, cardiovascular involvement, it means that the brainstem is involved. If it is, you know, involvement of only the sensorium and unconsciousness and convulsions, it is the cortical area which is involved, okay? And if the child has fever for three, four days and, you know, after four, five days, the child starts getting convulsions, it could be pyogenic meningitis. So there are different ways of approaching acute encephalitic syndrome. In general, remember that the duration, if it is short, it's likely to be dengue or uh, chikungunya. If it is intermediate, it could be typhoid. And if it is longer duration, it could be typhoid or scrub typhus, okay? So there is something like a typhoid, a tropical fever panel and the tropical fever maxi test 
true PCR and others. And uh, that's why you must remember that high index of suspicion is the key to early diagnosis. Uh, I always see, rather I was under the impression that, uh, you know, infectious diseases in pediatrics is an arena of uh, female pediatricians. And many for many years, I used to think that that is because they have high index of suspicion. But then our friends from Pune, uh, Pramod Kulkarni and KU and others have disproved this uh, myth, which was there in my mind, doesn't matter. So you need to follow the clinical course. And then the, in the second week, a close observation is needed. And remember that let the disease evolve, okay? If at all you are available to make is what's going on, involve our colleagues. We are fortunate to have our infectious disease experts in the town. Avoid irrational use of antibiotics and go for a syndromic approach in tropical fevers. Uh, there is hardly anything to be elaborated in the management because again, depending on the syndrome, if it is fever with thrombocytopenia, go in a particular way. If it is with jaundice, go in a particular way. Just keep those causes in front of you and then go for renal failure management, fever with encephalopathy, fever with respiratory distress and so on. Okay. There are also protocols which are based on rapid diagnostic tests. Okay. Because in the ICU, it is important that you, you know, diagnose the condition quickly. So depending on that, whether you get a focus or you do not get a focus, do the rapid diagnostic test and then proceed for the management. Okay. So uh, day one and two of fever, rule out the seriousness by asking those four questions which I told you. Observe, give paracetamol only. Day 3 and 4, look for localization. Day 5 and 7, uh, you know, come out of your bathroom shouting, Eureka, Eureka, you got the typhoid salmonella culture positive. Again, review and then rule out Kawasaki and entering. This protocol remains the same. Only thing is that tropical fevers have to be kept at the back of mind. With that, you will get a degree of MD, DNB and FIP where you will get, you know, the degree because you will make a diagnosis and document that is MD. You will decide the narrowest and the best antibody and you will become famous for intelligent antimicrobial practices. This is FIAP. With that, my dear friends, remember science, I always say, at its perfection becomes an art. So when you look at the child, you start guessing what is this, whether this appears to be a rash of dengue, whether it appears to be leptospira, or whether it appears to be scrub typhus, okay? So your job is basically to protect the child from the threat of the harm. So check the vitals. Remember that stops mnemonic that I told you. And most of the errors are because, you know, you do not take adequate history and do not examine properly. So first the history, then examination, then selected tests, and then evaluate the results intelligently and then take, go for a right diagnosis. That is the management of fever. With this, my dear friends, it is possible that maybe sometimes you may commit a mistake. But remember, if a mistake is not a stepping stone, then it's a mistake. So every mistake should be a stepping stone. Uh, and that is very important. With that, you may uh, commit pitfalls also. You may fall, but you get up. Some patients may leave you in this journey, but don't worry. You continue your journey. You will learn a lot. And uh, I wish you a happy journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Zog, sir, for simplifying for all of us the very important topic of fever in tropics in your unique and lucid way. Uh, so that concludes this amazing interactive and informative session, uh, second session of Pearls of Wisdom for the day. Now I request Dr. Lalit Kumar Dhoka, sir, to please come and give final vote of thanks. Dr. Dhoka, sir. Uh, if the professor is not able to uh, uh, not able so to join, uh, then may I please uh, may I please request Doctor uh, Shirish sir to come and give final vote of thanks. Hello, um, I um, thank you. Um, you know, um, this was an excellent activity. Actually, we could share uh, and understand what our uh, uh, seniors and uh, faculty spoke in uh, the Pedicon, and I think this activity should continue. Um, with all this, I would thank all the faculties, Kevur, Vinod, and uh, all the team members for their uh, excellent effort. Uh, thanks, and I conclude this activity. Over and above, I would like to make some announcement on 31st, uh, 31st of March, we have hematology update. Today night, there's one more webinar, and this has been conducted by uh, Dr. Nane Ma'am, Shailaja Nane Ma'am, along with uh, Dr. Padvidri. Uh, and this is an international, uh, the international speakers 
this is regarding development if those who are interested i have already shared the link uh, please join it thirdly there is pediatric respicon midterm respicon on june 22nd 23rd uh, the flyers and brochures are ready we have already circulated uh, the last date for early bird registration is 31st of march please see to it that you register as early as possible the link is shared on the flyer as well thank you thank you so much shirish and this concludes the session thank you to all of you bye 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 sunil bye